A couple of years ago, I was home alone. At the time, I was still living with my family, but they had gone on vacation and thus I had the house all to myself. Well, I had been working a lot of hours that week and it was my day off at the time. So I had the idea to call some of the boys for some cold ones. We drank the cold ones and at around 11 p.m., everyone decided to go home. Drunk and tired, I locked my doors, went upstairs to my room, and then knocked out cold. That is, until I woke up from the ding-dong of my doorbell. It was about 4 a.m. if I can recall correctly. Needless to say, I was still pretty drunk. For a few seconds, I asked myself, What the hell? Not really sure if I had actually heard the doorbell or if maybe it was just my imagination. So I decided to wait, but then I heard it again. I got up kind of groggy and then went to my hallway and then yelled, I'll be right there. I headed downstairs. As I made my way down, I started to panic. What if one of my friends got in a crash or never made it home? They weren't drunk like I was when they left, but still, you never really know. Or maybe I thought it was one of them returning for something. As I got to the door, I stupidly decided to open it. Well, it was my ex. For some quick background, me and my ex didn't really end on good terms. We dated for years, she cheated, and I was absolutely heartbroken, and we went back and forth like that. It literally took me about a whole year and a half to get over her, mainly by blocking her number all of her social media and even on email. Yes, she actually tried to contact me there as well. To put it kindly, she really filled the crazy ex stereotype. Plus, it had maybe been about three months since I finally cut her off, so needless to say, I was pretty confused. When I opened the door, I just said, Um, hi, in a really shy manner. Really confused, I then asked her, What are you doing here, Jenny? She just said, I wanted to see you and talk a little bit. So then I said, You know what time it is, right? And then she replied with, I know it's late, but I'm on my way to school and I wanted to stop by. Since it's on the way, I figured you'd be home alone. Now, this definitely weirded me out because how the hell did she know that? My family isn't in contact as far as I knew and I had my family block her off their social media as well. So I then asked her, Um, how did you know that? Oh, I just knew, she said. We kind of just paused and she asked me if she could come inside to talk. And stupidly, I said okay. After coming inside, she pet my dogs and we went to my living room and then sat down. We talked about how we were both doing really great in life and then just what I expected. She basically begged me to take her back. I said no and she began to cry and so did I. Well, one thing led to another and then to my room and I guess you can imagine what occurred next. I was feeling pretty guilty and regretful as soon as we finished, and I made the excuse that I had to work the next day. She then began pleading to let her stay, and I kept saying no, which she then began screaming at me that I was using her. To which I replied some pretty mean things, and then I kicked her out. So I thought that was that. Wrong. After about 20 minutes, I had returned to my room until I heard a pounding on my door. Pretty much instantly I knew who it was, and I went to open the door. It was, of course, my ex. She then came inside my house without even asking me. She looked really flustered like she had just went on a jog or something, and she definitely still looked angry. But there was one thing, my gut feeling, and it was telling me something was off. When she came inside, I noticed that one of my dogs began to make a low growl at her. Now, this never really occurs since they've known her for over two years and they usually really liked her. I noticed it, but just kept my cool. I asked her what she wanted and if she would just leave already. She then just looked at me with these piercing eyes and then said to me in a shaking voice, Why do you always do this? Then she got closer to me. At the same time, I want you to keep in mind that she was wearing a zip-up hoodie that had two pockets on each side. She had her right hand free, but she had the other one in her pocket. I wasn't 100% sure, but I could tell that she was gripping something. My mind then raced and then I thought, Crap, I'm about to get stabbed to death by my crazy ex and not be found until my family comes back. 
Almost on cue right after thinking this, my second dog then starts barking like absolutely crazy at her. My dog's name is Ash and she's a pretty weird dog. She's really lazy and she rarely ever barks at anything, and especially at people. So this on top of my ex giving me this really weird feeling actually made me a little scared. To which I then told Jenny, Look, I'm really sorry what happened, but it was a mistake. I really have to work and you really need to leave already. This totally lit the fuse. She went totally ballistic. I'm talking spitting in my face and strained red eyes while yelling at me. To be honest, I can't really remember what she had yelled about, but it probably wasn't good. And the entire time of her rant, she never once took her hand out of her pocket. She did finally calm down though, and she pretty much just stood there inches away from my face breathing really heavy. And my dog still barking at her the entire time. The look on her face that she had is the one that you can tell someone wants to do or say something, but they're just holding back from doing what they really want to do by like a threat of mental power or something. Personally, I really didn't want to find out what was in her pocket or what she wanted to do to me. So really annoyed and very much worried after this verbal onslaught, I just simply told her, Get the hell out of my house or I'm calling the cops. Very angrily, she then paused and then she said, You're going to regret this. And then finally she left. I locked my door after that, went straight to my room, and then looked out my window for the next few hours. Thankfully, she didn't come back. Since that day, I haven't seen or talked to my ex. I'm not really sure if I was just being paranoid or if I really was about to regret letting her inside. Hopefully I won't ever have to see her again. I would like to make something abundantly clear in the beginning of this. I was very naive in my youth. Again, very naive. While my ex was very emotionally, sexually, and mentally abusive, he was smart enough to never lay a hand on me physically. He used gaslighting manipulation and carefully hidden sadism to control me for eight years. I always forgave him for every slight against me, every instance of cruelty every mental assault, and every sexual attack as well. I always forgave him because I thought he loved me and that I was his property, because we'd been together for a really long time and I wore his promise ring. In my mind, I was dealing with a lot of actions that would eventually go away with age. I was 17 years old when I finally got the courage to leave him. Since then though, he's left me messages on my Facebook, my phone, my email, and he's even called me from texting apps as well. He always leaves the same message. I'm still here. Every month like clockwork. Same time, same day, and same message. He's done this for six years and I couldn't do anything about it. He wasn't breaking any law so I couldn't really report him. And no one really cared about it anyway. So I blocked each account and just continued on with my life. But then about two months ago, the messages then seemed to completely stop. And I think I know why. I had gotten engaged to another man the same day that he messaged me for the last time, and I decided to post about it on Facebook, and then magically out of nowhere, the messages just stopped. I'm guessing he stopped because I'm going to marry someone else and I'm no longer his property, at least in his mind. This is the only thing that makes sense to me, that he believes I belong to someone else now and not him, but I have a feeling I haven't seen the last of him. But I really hope that's not the case. I met a guy online back in August of last year. We immediately hit it off. I was reluctant to get in a relationship though, as I had been cheated on a few months prior and lied to that entire relationship. Catching feelings for anyone again scared the hell out of me. But this guy was so sweet and nice that I just trusted him and was willing to risk it for him. Skip to mid-September. We had both admitted feelings for each other a while before this, but he was reluctant to ask me out. I wasn't sure why, but I figured he was just waiting for the right moment. Which he was. Because he slipped that his birthday was coming up, and I pointed out how come he's turning 19 and still in high school. Then he said that he isn't 18, He's 17, and he's turning 18 in a few days. 
This pissed me off because although we've never been sexual, I'm 18 and I do not like being lied to. We both met in a place that's only for 18 plus people. He pointed out that I never directly asked him his age. I just assumed because of where we met. Despite this, when he turned 18 and asked me out, I said yes. We lasted less than a month. He would start fights every single day over the dumbest stuff. If I took over 10 minutes to reply, he would get pissed and told me I need to tell him when I was going to go do stuff so he wasn't waiting for my message. He got mad that I've been in relationships before him, despite none of them turning out good, etc. So I broke up with him. I thought maybe in the future things would stop because this is his first relationship and he was just inexperienced. I told him multiple times, calmly, that things need to change and once the fight stopped we can try again. But they never stopped for more than a few days. One time he lied to me saying some girl had been flirting with him and asked if he was single or taken just so I'd confirm our relationship, which I didn't, because we weren't dating anymore and he got mad. I pointed out it was obviously a lie, but he insisted it happened. Only later that evening did he admit it was a lie. Eventually I shut off my Snapchat map because I didn't want him knowing where specifically I lived, and he got mad that I didn't trust him. One of my best IRL friends messaged me asking why he was requesting to follow her. I checked his Instagram, and he had started following everyone who was following me. I told him to unfollow them, because he doesn't even know any of them, and it's kind of weird. He got mad, but he did unfollow them. Two weeks ago, I woke up one morning, and he told me we needed to talk. He asked me why I've been lying to him, why I've been hiding things behind his back. I asked him what he was talking about because I have never lied to him, nor hid anything from him. He said he's been messaging all my friends on Instagram, asking for information about me, who I've dated, what I've been doing, etc. He asked me why I've been FaceTiming people behind his back not telling him everything about my past relationships. I don't know if I was more shocked the fact that he did this, or the fact that these people were actually giving him info about me. I never did anything behind his back though. The only person I had ever FaceTimed, FaceTimed me first, randomly, and for 30 minutes just to play 8-ball on iMessage. He even mentioned talking to people who I haven't talked to in months. He also made alternate accounts, befriending people from my past, voice chatting with them, playing games with them, all just to get info from them about me once they opened up. Anyways, he even mentioned that my ex had messaged me, which I never told anyone, so I have no idea how he found that out. My Snapchat kept logging me out, so I think he hacked into my Snapchat to read my convos with people also. He found my old Reddit, and went back two years of comment history to get mad at stuff I've said in my past. The day after he emailed me saying that there's nothing left to say, we're just acquaintances now, etc, etc. I told him nah, we aren't even acquaintances anymore. He's just some crazy dude I dated. And it's his loss in the end, because he caused this by doing detective work, as he liked to put it. He said he did all this because he was curious, not that he didn't trust me, and he found lots of stuff he didn't want to, I guess about my past relationships, because that's all he ever really mentioned. His little tangent went on for quite a while, saying he's my loss and he could have made me happy and blah blah blah. I told him he never could have made me happy. His money, which wasn't much, maybe, but not him as a person, not since the first fight started. I'm sure there's a lot of examples I'm missing out on saying, but in the end, I blocked him, and I hope to never see or hear from him again. But I fear after all he's done, that he'll pull some crap from that you show. This isn't so much one encounter, but it was a terrifying experience. I've never told this story to anyone, besides the police, but I've been thinking a lot about it lately. 
and only recently realized how much the whole thing really messed me up. So here goes. I met this guy at the bar one night. We had a great time, partied all night, and eventually ended up back at my apartment. After that night, he basically lived with me instead of the hostel he was staying at. We clicked right away, and I enjoyed having him there. We dated for about three months before the first night he attacked me. It was the night of my 30th birthday. We celebrated, had a blast, and passed out at about 3 a.m. He told me he suffered from PTSD and night terrors. He had woken up many nights freaking out. I was deeply passed out when I awoke to five quick blows to the head and face. I tried to cover myself not knowing at all what the hell was happening when I realized my arms were pinned at my sides. He was sitting on my chest with his legs on my arms and strangling me before I had any idea where I even was. I only remember the light fading and going black as he squeezed harder on my neck. When he let go, the blood eventually rushed back to my brain and I remember seeing him walk to the bathroom. At that point, I grabbed the dogs and ran to my car and took off. He must have passed back out. He called me hours later, completely confused as to where I went. I told him everything he had done, and he promised me he didn't mean to do any of that. He would never do that on purpose, and he promised to seek help. I agreed to come back on the terms if he even scared me again, he'd be gone. Exactly one week later, again in my sleep, I woke up to him on top of me. But not doing anything, I slowly pushed him off and pretended to be getting ready for work. Out of nowhere, he jumped up and sucker punched me in the mouth. I fell onto the bed, and he again tried to strangle me this time. I didn't fight, and pretended to pass out. He let me go once he thought I passed out, and went to the kitchen. As soon as he left, I grabbed the dogs again and booked it to the car. I jumped in the car and locked it. This time he chased me. That was when I realized this wasn't some PTSD nightmare sleepwalking freakout. He was a psychopath. He was awake and very coherent. He was screaming that he'd burn my house down if I didn't come out, trying to break the windows to get into my car. As soon as I got the doors locked, I called the cops. He went back inside. When the cops arrived, I told them he's crazy and might try to attack them. When they went in, he was quietly waiting for them and went with them without any resistance. He knew what he did. It wasn't until during the trial I found out that there was a knife in my bed. When he let go of me and went to the kitchen thinking I was passed out, he went to get a butcher's knife and left it on the bed when he chased me out. No one can prove what he was planning, but I am convinced he was going to stab me to death. He wasn't charged with anything in the end because the DA pulled some fancy lawyering maneuvers and tricked him into walking right into the arms of ICE as soon as he left the courthouse. I have to say that was satisfying to watch. He was deported and banned from the country. He still tries to contact me on social media by making new accounts to try to get me to help with his appeal to be allowed back. Nope. He still claims he wasn't awake for any of this. I don't know what I believe, but I know I feel a hell of a lot safer with him on the other side of the globe. I've been having a hard time sleeping since then. I kind of brushed everything off and carried on with my life as if none of this ever happened. Thinking about it recently, I realized being attacked in your sleep and coming that close to possibly being a murder victim might cause some lasting psychological damage. I am considering seeking help. I think maybe sharing the story for once might be a healthy first step. This took place about two years ago when I was 20 years old, so my memory is a little foggy. The story is about my best friend's crazy ex-boyfriend. It doesn't really affect me as much as it affected her. However, I was there for the whole ordeal. The last guy was a creep, but this one totally takes the cake. You see, my friend kind of has a type. Despite her being this really beautiful, cheerful girl, she loves to find guys that want her to do everything for them. They want her to literally pay for everything and do everything for them, periodically paying for groceries just to make it even. 
Now, I don't really have any issues with her dating a guy down on his luck, you know, and working hard to get on his feet. We've almost all been there. That's fine. Some just have to start from the ground up, and that's fine. But this guy wasn't like that. We're talking him being a straight-up male gold digger. This guy had no intention of ever trying to better himself or his position. He was a user and an abuser, and I could tell that from the very second I met him. When I walked into her apartment, I then saw this guy sitting on her couch, and my heart fell. He gave me really bad vibes, even worse than the last. I'm not going to describe him because, quite honestly, his looks don't really have anything to do with just how terrible of a person he was. I didn't like him, but I always played nice because I just wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt. I thought, maybe I'm being too judgmental. It's not really fair of me to judge him like that when we've just met. Well, as it turns out, my gut feeling was right though. Fast forward a few months later and I had moved about 8 hours away to a new school for university. My friend Emmy and her family went to a nearby city to visit her sister, so I then met them there and we stayed a night there. We had met up and went to lunch and while there, she then started telling me about this jerk she was dating. I had known that he moved in with her and would always borrow her car, so that really didn't surprise me. What was a surprise though was that she actually wanted to dump him. She was telling me how he had become increasingly more territorial, always checking her phone and literally always wanting to know where she was. He was also becoming pretty verbally and physically abusive when she wouldn't comply. Initially, she was just thinking about dumping him, and I also started to encourage her to do that. I was really worried about her safety and mental health, especially with living with someone like that. And it also seemed to sound like all of his angry outbursts were just getting more frequent. She seemed to become more determined and she said that she planned to break up with him when she got home. I told her that when she does that she should probably take someone with her so that he doesn't try and hurt her. She then dismissed me saying that he wouldn't do that and I then warned her. Look, guys like this are really unstable. He's going to do one of three things. One, verbally attack you. Two, physically attack you. Or three, he's probably going to threaten suicide if you try and leave him. Or maybe even all three of those if he's crazy enough. She just laughed me off and that was the end of the conversation. We went on with the day shopping, going to dinner, and then watching a movie. We had slept together on the pull-out couch and it was a pretty laid-back night. At around 7 a.m., I was then woken up to her crying on the phone. I didn't really move at first as I was really just listening to what was happening. She was then pacing on the other side of the room, then pretty much crying and begging him to stop. He was calling her all kinds of names and accusing her of cheating on him. He was screaming so loudly on the phone that even I could hear him. You're such a whore. If you give me an STD, I'm going to kill you and your entire family. She was just sobbing the whole time. I'm going to freaking throw your car keys off of a bridge and burn your car, you stupid whore. I honestly couldn't believe what I was hearing. Hell, I still don't believe it. My memory is usually crap, but I remember it clearly. I then got up and then took the phone from her, then doing something that I probably shouldn't have done, but thankfully it didn't really have any repercussions. And then I started screaming at him. I dare you to touch her car. Do it. Touch it and you're going to jail. I'm a witness now. Go ahead and try it, little boy. I hung up the phone and then threw it on the bed, then asking her what the hell happened. Apparently, since she didn't answer his phone call at 4 in the morning, he assumed that she was cheating on him. He kept calling back. One of the times I answered, I told him to stop or I'd call the police for harassment. When he kept going on, I really didn't know what to do. She was a mess and I was way too angry to think at the time. I went into her parents' room and I woke her mom up. This may be weird to some, but I've known her since we were kids and I'm really close to her family. Also, her mother the night before actually tried to beg me to get them to break up. Her mom is very kind and really involved in her life and her friends' lives as well. So while this may be weird to some, it's pretty normal for us. I told her mom what had happened and while doing that, her dad woke up and he was immediately furious. Her dad stepped in, answering the phone, and threatening to call the car in stolen, since it was actually his name that was on the car and not my friend's. He then told the crazy boyfriend to leave it at the apartment. 
After all of that, I go home. On the way home, I decided to call her and she told me that he was texting her saying he was going to kill himself if she left him. She was starting to feel guilty and actually scared he would actually do it. The cold-hearted part of me told her to call his dad and tell him. In my mind, it was his family's problem, not hers. They really need to help him if he's having mental distress. I mean, it's not her fault. Unfortunately, they dated another five months after this happened. What got them to break up? Not the abuse, not the crazy, not the fact that he had a warrant out for his arrest in Florida for a traffic violation, or the fact that he had a relationship with a minor there as well. Not the fact that he had a crazy ex-girlfriend who went to my friend's city and threatened to beat her up for him. Not the fact that he would shoplift hundreds of dollars worth of items from Wally World. Nope. They broke up because he ended up going to jail. I don't remember why, but I'm pretty sure it was the shoplifting. I could ask her, but I don't like to bring him up to her. It's been about a year or two now, and she's raising his dog that he had gotten as a puppy before he was arrested. That really worries me that he may come back someday for his dog, and knowing her, she just might go back to him. I'm pretty sure he hated me or still hates me because I threatened to call the cops on him. And if I have to, I still will. I'm not really sure where he is now, if he's still in jail or if he's out. Not even sure what state he's in. No matter where he is though, I just really hope he stays the hell away from my friend and for good. My husband had dated a beauty queen title holder whom he had broke up with long before we ever met. However, I was the first really serious girlfriend that he had dated after they broke up. And well, once she knew about me, our lives became a living nightmare for a while. I guess she always figured that he would go back to her because she was so beautiful. And on top of being really crazy, she was also a narcissist. Anyway, we start dating and then the phone calls start. She would always call over and over all hours of the night, forcing my husband to then switch off his phone. So it escalated. I began to start getting flat tires on my car, then I started noticing random dents in my car as well. I had no proof this was her of course, but it seemed pretty coincidental. She then started calling and threatening my husband that if he doesn't give her money, she'll call the police and then report him that he used to abuse her. My husband was pretty worried because, well, he wasn't really guilty of doing any of this, but it would be her word against his and his reputation would be pretty much ruined. One night she approached me at a party when I came out of the bathroom, but it was more like she ambushed me. So where's your man at? You should keep an eye on your man. She had slurred in her heavy accent. It was kind of intimidating because she's over six feet tall and I'm only five foot five and she was in heels at the time so she was literally about six foot five, no joke. She had totally towered over me. I pretty much just ignored her at this point and then walked away, but then she followed me. Not really saying anything though, just kept up the pace and walked beside me, sort of bending forward to be more on eye level with me, looking straight at me with really crazy eyes but walking and gritting really creepily. After that happened, we pretty much just stopped going to any kind of events if we had any inkling that she would be there as well. However, we did attend a funeral for a mutual friend of ours. During the reception, I was talking to a couple that I knew and she just walked up right beside me and stood with us. She pretty much just stood there as if part of the conversation. Not talking, just standing there and listening to our intimate group of three. She was completely nuts. I didn't want to cause a scene at a funeral, so I walked back to my husband who had just been talking to the man's widow. That was the final straw. We got a lawyer who sent her a cease and desist. It didn't even phase her. She would then call my husband from private numbers and then say, Hi, it's me, in a sing-song voice like nothing even happened. Three cease and desist letters later and she was still calling. We were eventually finally able to get a restraining order against her. I really used to be so intimidated by her. She was tall, blonde, and pretty statuesque. She was the epitome of a beauty queen. However, as I got to realize who she truly was, I began to realize that she was the ugliest person I had ever met, despite her outside appearance. Whenever I see a picture of her, all I see are her mean cold eyes. I don't see any beauty in her whatsoever. 
I used to think that beauty pageants were so much more than skin deep, that contestants were judged for more than just their looks. However, in this case, I was so wrong. I also found out that we were apparently not the only ones who had to file a restraining order against her. We haven't seen her in years since this all happened, although we still to this day continuously get these fake Instagram follow requests that we know are her. I know this because she's actually dumb enough to always have herself as a follower or her brother, or she'll follow random people in our lives, like my husband's colleagues or my mom, which is absolutely insane to me. I just don't know why she won't let go already. My husband and I have a baby now, and I'm always vigilant. I honestly really don't know what she's capable of. This woman once had the whole world at her feet. She had a platform that would have given her opportunities that the rest of us might never have. But I guess she just wanted money with the minimal amount of work involved. All she ever did was cheat and use people. It's awful. The last I heard, she became an escort, and she apparently lives in a shelter now. Clearly, there's some major mental issues at play here. But I mean, she was a terrible, selfish person long before that. So to the crazy beauty queen, ex-girlfriend from hell, I really hope you get the help that you need and that me nor my husband ever see you again. Please. So I like to go walking in the cemetery near my house pretty much almost every day. This time, however, I decided I would go later than usual. It was about 7 p.m. and still pretty light out. I had my phone and pepper spray with me. As I was crossing the busy street which stood between my neighborhood and the cemetery, there was a black SUV that slowed down next to me and then said the usual cat callish kind of stuff. Being that I usually get cat called really often, I just ignored it and expected the SUV to just keep driving once I crossed into the cemetery. Well, once I was in the cemetery, the car made a U-turn and then proceeded to head right for me near the cemetery. My heart then sank. I knew that I couldn't go back to my house because that would then entail me crossing this really busy street and potentially showing this guy where I live. As the car then drove right into the cemetery, I went and walked to one of the plots so that I could hide myself. I basically just crouched down right behind a tombstone and then prayed that he couldn't see me. The car began to slow down to a crawl and was slowly driving around, just looking for me. I just stayed hidden and soon enough, the car drove away. I waited behind the grave for a while after that because something just told me to stay a little longer. Sure enough, five minutes later, the SUV returned. I know it was the same car because of the bumper stickers that was on the back of it. Not only was this the same SUV, but it was also back with another car. Both of the cars were just slowly driving around where I was. The driver of the car was yelling something along the lines of, Hey you whore, I'm gonna find you. And let me just tell you, I was totally terrified. Thankfully, both of the cars went out of sight really far back into the cemetery. That's when I saw my chance and then I immediately sprinted right out of the cemetery and then ran across the street. I got home safe, but I just kept replaying what could have happened to me if I had done something different. I know I wasn't hurt, but I just can't get it out of my mind what could have happened. My city has a really bad known human trafficking problem, so as you can imagine, I'm understandably pretty terrified by what could have happened. So whoever that was in the black SUV, I'm really glad you didn't succeed in whatever you were planning for me. This happened around 2004. I was 13 years old and hanging out with two of my really good girlfriends who were about the same age as me. We had went swimming at one of their houses for a while and then we decided to go for a walk. Walks were something that we did pretty often and we would sometimes go pretty far. This time though, we didn't really go that far at all, which I'm really glad for because we definitely needed the energy. They lived a bit down the street from our local library, and there's a cemetery right near it. The size of the cemetery was a mix between medium and large. We would wander past or through it on our adventures pretty regularly. 
It was starting to get dark and we figured we should go back to the one's large house to change into our pajamas and maybe watch a movie before bed. We were almost there, walking on the sidewalk right next to the cemetery. Near the intersection where we needed to cross, there was a red light at the moment. One car then crept up right next to us. The left side of the road was on our side of the sidewalk. We were now starting to walk against traffic. Now we were trying to walk a little faster, getting a little uncomfortable that this car right next to us was keeping our pace. The car was filled with about three guys that were definitely much older than us. Maybe in their late 20s if I had to guess. They started to catcall us and then invite us into their car. Then one of them said, Come on ladies, why don't you take a ride with us? My one friend decided to tell them off. The men were now screaming at us and as the light turns green, they pull right into the lane, avoiding oncoming traffic and then go right through the green light. We stopped walking because we were watching these creeps drive away from us. Nope. They bust a U-turn and then speed back towards us pretty much immediately, head on. The friend and I scream for our third friend to start running. She's an idiot and not moving, so we grab her hands and then we book it right into the cemetery. We start running as deep as we can and then we start hiding behind the headstones. I was behind one of the headstones by myself and my smart friend was behind another that was a couple few feet away with the other. She actually had to put her hand over our idiot friend's mouth because the stupid ass wouldn't shut up. She kept whispering that she didn't understand why we were so scared and hiding. The idiot finally kept quiet though when she had then heard the car door slam from where we ran from. Two of the three creeps from the car were now entering the cemetery. They had then started calling for us to come out. We had then heard them saying, Come on, we just want to have some fun with y'all. They then started saying really disgusting things and what they were going to do to us when they found and caught us. They then began checking behind all of the headstones, making really loud noises in the hopes that we would scream and reveal where we were. I could then hear my heart just totally pounding. They were getting closer. I was thinking of all the ways that I could run and maybe how I could fight back if they catch me. But I was really scared for my friends. They were a few rows away from us when we all heard the third creep then call out to them to just give up on us and to just come back to their car to complete their beer run. They had also referred to us as little sluts. I know, such class. Once they finally walked towards where they came from for a couple of rows, us three little sluts then ran out of the other end of the cemetery so damn fast. We ran across the street and we hid in the first bunch of bushes that we saw that seemed pretty thick enough for what felt like an hour. We wanted to make sure that they actually drove away and weren't just circling around until we emerged. After our time in the bush, we all ran back to the house and then we all collapsed behind the log door. I have no idea what those men were planning to do with us, but I'm really really glad we never found out. This happened about two years ago. First of all, I want to start by talking about the cemetery and the area around it. The cemetery is visually really stunning. It has a completely open area where you can see all of the graves around and into the distance. There's a spooky maze-like section with nature overwhelming the gravestones with the overgrown plants everywhere. And there's also a large church that's located at the far end of it. It's really eerie, but also very beautiful at the same time. But before this incident, I never really cared about this graveyard all that much. I walked past it when having to go to meet my friends or when I took a shortcut to get home, and recently to get to college. The cemetery was next to some of the very spooky alleyways and a council estate, so you always had to watch your back whenever you walked through this place mainly due to the constant rumors of drug dealers, muggers, and all sorts roaming that area at night. Nevertheless, the cemetery didn't really seem that interesting to me. That is, until one of my friends told me a bizarre story involving his brothers and their friends. During the night, the brothers and their friends used to play a game inside the cemetery. I don't recall my friend telling me exactly what the game was, but it's not that important to the story. They were just being typical teenagers, causing mischief to make the day worth it since the district had the excitement of watching grass grow. After about 20 minutes of doing their little game, 
they then began to notice something off. The guys began feeling like they were being watched or something. The atmosphere itself began to turn dark and bleak. Tension was among themselves because they knew they weren't alone anymore. And soon enough, one of the guys saw it. It was a person. This person was wearing a cloak and he was holding something. The person was crouching under the gravestones and was silently trying to move from one to the other, trying to get closer to them. Well, one of them happened to notice it, and he then informed the others of the situation. They turned, all of them, and before any of the others could spit out a word, the cloaked man then began chasing them, holding a hammer-like weapon in his hands. The guy was insanely fast, according to my friend, but due to the adrenaline rush and the sport background of his opposing forces, the teenagers were faster. I don't want to make their story any longer, so I guess I'll just finish it by saying that they eventually jumped over a really large fence and they managed to escape the cloaked man. The second they jumped over, a large thud was then heard and the fence was pushed forward. The cloaked man had hit the fence with his large hammer and he was pretty close to cracking open a skull. After that happened, they eventually got home and two of them told their brother, which was my friend. Now, at first, I didn't really believe this story, and neither did any of my other friends. The friend named Sam, who's the one that told me of this story, doesn't exactly lie a lot, and he seemed pretty serious when he told me. I was thinking that his brothers were just lying to him, but I thought, you know what, screw it. I'm gonna go see for myself if this cloak man is really there, and you guys are coming with me. After about a day of presenting my friends with a little adventure idea, I began planning where we should meet and how we're going to do this quest. Suddenly my friend David sends me a text. He had already went looking for the cloaked man the night before with his friends. His encounter with the cloaked man was a little less than frantic than the other confrontation, but this time a lot more outlandish. David had went with two other people. When they began to get deep into the cemetery's entrance, one of the guys immediately then shouted, Hey, no face! Dave tried to tell him to shut up, but he just wouldn't stop. The group then carried on through the pathway, surrounded by dead people, until they reached a shed. It was large. David and the others hid behind a bush, and then they saw him. The cloaked man was inside the shed. He was examining his weapons. Apparently a large hammer, a rusty-looking wrench, and a really decaying machete. Eventually he stopped and went out of his shed and into the church. Unexpectedly, the church bell was heard, loudly. The guys watching don't really know what the hell's going on, but the bell is ringing for a pretty good minute. The bell is, strangely enough, ringing in some weird kind of pattern. Dave tells the others to get up and go back to another spot. They hide behind a bench this time, being further away from the strange church. Then the cloaked man comes out of it, looking concerned and ready to attack them. He has an axe out. Panic then rushes through everyone behind the bench, making everyone involved to quickly agree to get the hell out of there. They try to sneak out of there, but David keeps his eyes on the cloaked man. What the cloaked man does will give my friend various amounts of what the hell kind of thoughts forever. The cloaked man then stops dead in his tracks and then he just falls to the ground. What's he doing? He's crawling around the gravestones very rapidly, going from one to the other. However, he's not just doing that alone, he's also making noises. The cloaked man is then spewing out growling-like sounds and begins to conquer the frigid emotionless graveyard. Then abruptly, he then gets up and then he smashes one of the gravestones with his axe without any reason whatsoever. And then he lets out a really haunting scream up to the skies, and again without any reason. David at this point pretty much says screw hiding and they all run away. The cloaked man doesn't chase them, just looks into the distance. When he finally finished his story of discovering more about the cloaked man, I thought that there would be no point in going there now. We all know that this cloaked man is a freaking weirdo that preys on teens and poor short-lived gravestones. I mean, what else could you really find out? Well, I'm really big on adventure, so I thought that me, David, Sam, and many of the others should go and explore a little bit more and see what we could find out. I just really wanted to see what else this guy does. So a few days later, we have our team. It was me, Sam, David, Charlie, and Mike. 
Charlie's just a fat slob and Mike, well, he's the witty one of our group. So we all decided to meet up at the local tube station at daytime. Yeah, yeah, we were going to go at nighttime at first, but everyone was out. So we went during the middle of the day instead. We slowly began to walk through the empty alleyways and the council houses until we got to the gates, which were locked. We then jumped over and that's when we began our adventure. Sadly, Charlie and Mike just weren't having it and climbed back out. They weren't going to go anywhere though. They were just going to wait for us. We wanted them to come with us, but after about a minute, we just left them and we walked through the large pathway with the gravestones all around us. Twenty minutes went by. Nothing was happening. Instead of going straight to the shed, we decided to take another route. All of us had went through the claustrophobic maze-like section where all of the gravestones were pretty much just covered with plant vines. We began walking around and we began arguing amongst each other. Sam was really bored and wanted out. Dave didn't really care that much, but I wanted to go back to the open and try and find the shed and church. About five minutes of pointless arguing later, and we suddenly hear footsteps. We began looking around. Nothing. Dude, get your phone out. Sam says to me. All right, man, wait a sec. I reply. So I get my phone out and unlock it, and I go to the camera. I'm pointing at the remoteness with my iPhone, but nothing is lurking in the distance. At least, not in our vision. We knew someone was near us, so we began to frantically walk right through this maze. Sam wants me to begin recording, so I decide to do just that. Since nothing was happening again, the recording just becomes a really dragged out video of us just walking around like idiots and then looking in every direction. I switched the damn phone off at this point, and we just began to go deeper into the cemetery. It gets darker and darker and tighter and tighter. Then I see it. The cloaked man is following us. I finally saw him. It was when I looked behind and I noticed that he was hiding behind a huge angel statue. He was ridiculously close to us. Guys, I see him behind us. Let's get the hell out of here. I'm shouting. Are you sure? says David. David, being the pretty confident and curious guy of our group, then walks back and actually tries to catch the guy. Now, I didn't want this crazy guy to pop out and get us, but I wasn't going to leave my friend. So we all went behind the statue. He was gone. Sam got pretty paranoid and he wanted us to get out. He had a really crawly feeling that the cloaked man was staring at us. But we just continued on being the idiots we were, and that's when I spot him again right on the other side. He was a little bit further away from us this time, so I wasn't as scared, but I could definitely see him trying to get closer, blending in horribly with the trees. I started freaking out. David and Sam had noticed something moving, so we ran about 30 feet away and trying to hide. The cloaked man was now going in the other direction, and he entered the church, which was pretty noticeable where we hid. Then we heard those bells. David had confirmed that those bells were the same ones he heard the other night. Then the cloaked man came out and with his really huge axe. Without any hesitation, he charged at our direction. Let me just clarify the locations by saying that we were still in the maze-like area of the cemetery, but we could still see the open area in the distance where the gravestones and church were at. So he was far away but charging our direction. He knew where we were. Even though we were hiding and nowhere near him, he still knew our location. He didn't change directions or anything. He just sprinted in one line with his axe in both hands. When I realized that he was getting closer and closer to us, I then yelled, Run! And we booked it. We ran and ran and when I looked behind, he was right there ready to swing at us. We didn't want to split up so we ran around the maze until we finally found a pathway with large hedges on the side. There was no going back. We all ran and ran through the path, but after running down this path, I was beginning to have a heart attack. When I looked in front of me, I felt so much fear. I was already beginning to lose hope. It was a dead end. Me and my friends were greeted by a locked shed at the end of the path. There was no way to get inside of it and no way to climb on top of it. We had the feeling of dread just totally taking over our bodies. We waited a few minutes and, surprisingly, the cloaked man didn't come. 
We silently went the other direction, and we stumbled back over the overgrown plant gravestone maze. We looked everywhere, finding broken tombstones and ripped up branches all over the place. There was silence for about ten minutes, when we looked in every direction again, hoping the cloaked man was gone. All of us were sneaking around until we finally got out of the maze, and the claustrophobic feeling of that horrible area then disappeared. The mundane gray clouds that had suddenly appeared made the open cemetery look even more disturbing and bleak than it already was. As we continue to walk on, we then hear a thunderstorm and it sounds like it's going to rain. We try and jog out of there when we then look and then see something sticking out. Holy crap! We see the cloaked man right in the distance with his hood off, standing right on top of a gravestone. His face was visible, but not exactly. For some weird reason, he was wearing some kind of cliché Halloween mask. We then stare at him for about 20 seconds, before he then goes down and then he begins crawling again. Crawling right in our direction. Screw that, we ran and ran until we jumped over the fence. What? Charlie and Mike weren't there. The bastards must have got bored and left us, but I guess we can't really blame them. After all of that happened, we were so freaked out that we decided to never go to that cemetery ever again. We eventually made it home and that was it. The next day though, I walked through a street and I noticed the cemetery on the left side of it. And I then saw red tape and then police inside of the graveyard right next to the church. I really wish I would have asked the police officer what was going on there. But I was just way too freaked out to ever go back there, even with the police there. I never did find out what happened there, and now that I think about it, I don't really think I want to know. There were apparently rumors that the guy that was stalking and chasing us was really just the caretaker wearing a mask, and that he was really just trying to scare people who went to the graveyard just to mess around. So the police investigation probably has nothing to do with the cloaked man. At least, I really hope not. I want to start off by saying that everybody in this story is safe, but it's one of the closest calls that I've ever had in my life, and I feel like I have to tell my story in order to raise awareness. I live in a major city in practically the pit of hell state, born and raised here, and I'm very familiar with my surroundings. I'm also aware of the fact that my city is one of the worst hubs for human trafficking, and living here can be very, very dangerous. Despite all of this, I've really taken pride in knowing that I can do everything I can to remain as safe as possible. I mean, I've had close calls before, so I'm always pretty prepped. At the time, I had two things of pepper spray. One in my favorite jacket pocket, and one velcro to my desk at work. I also had two trusty pocket knives, one always on me, and one in my car door pocket. Oh, and my taser literally never leaves my bag. I avoid shady situations at all costs, and despite being a really small lady, I really know my stuff. Yay for self-defense classes. My point in telling you all this is I'm a very paranoid small chihuahua, and I still got into a really scary situation. Alright, on to the story. It's summer and it's hot as hell. I've got a date with my favorite gal pal, and I swing by her place to pick her up. She tells me that first she has to go to a job interview, and I agree to go with her. No big deal. She's a really sweet tiny thing from a small town in the Midwest, and she's pretty new to the city life, as well as to all the wild things that can happen here. As we drive into a different city, I ask her about the job. Oh, it's a modeling gig. Oh, cool. For who? I say. I found an ad on Craigslist. It's just sport clothes. The Craigslist thing sets a really small but distant alarm off in my head, but I just push it to the side. Where the heck are we going anyway? I say when we then pull up to a Starbucks a bit outside of the city. The alarm in my head becomes a little less faint at this point. Just relax, I tell myself. I've gone to legit job interviews at coffee shops before. There's always been a good reason. We arrive first, still kind of late, but end up waiting about 15 minutes. Kind of weird, but Kat's relieved that we're not the rude ones when she then gets a text saying he's here. I look around the Starbucks and outside of the parking lot trying to figure out who the mystery man can be, 
when I then noticed a tall, well-dressed man step out of a black SUV. The man then smiles at us as he then approaches us, and I figure that's gotta be our guy. I could have sworn though that the SUV had been parked there for a while. I ask Kat if she wants me to step in line to grab her a drink, but she practically begs me to stay with her. Okay, I can do that. I don't think it'd look very professional, but I won't protest. The man who goes by the name Jack then leads us to an isolated table outside and doesn't really say much about my presence other than it was okay for me to be there. I get on my phone and I shoot a text to my fiance explaining where I was and what I was doing. He shoots me back and be careful and I pretty much just sit there to watch the show. Jack had this really strange accent that I just couldn't place my finger on. Looking back though, I'm not even sure it was real. He starts asking Kat the usual questions, and I notice she's absolutely bombing the interview. She doesn't have much experience and didn't really bother to bring a portfolio, but despite this, he doesn't really seem to care. The alarm in my head now was much louder than a whisper, but it completely blares when he then asks her if she'd be comfortable doing lingerie shoots as well. Dear Sweet Cat says she doesn't have an issue with it, but would prefer to mostly do sports clothing like they had discussed earlier. She asks to see some of his work, and he then pulls up a lingerie Instagram. All lingerie. No clothing at all. He holds it in front of her face and then pulls it away pretty much immediately. And when she asked if there was going to be more that she'd be doing, Jack says, That was it. And then just kind of hurries the conversation along. He says that we need to leave right now to go to his studio at a place that he briefly mentioned the name of to sign papers and get everything squared away. It has to be done today. He's not working tomorrow and his co-workers won't do it right. I absolutely hate everything about this and I'm trying to glare some sense into her, but nothing is getting through. Kat then agrees and he then turns his attention to me. So, uh, do you want in on this too? I immediately know that nothing about this is professional. I then look down at my beat up docks, my green cargo pants, and a shirt that has flames on it and a slightly edgy logo, and I really can't help but scoff. That's not really my thing. I'm just the ride, I say. He kind of just studies me for a second, and then he says we can all ride with him, then directing all of his attention to Cat. No, I don't want to leave my car here. We'll follow you. He looks kind of offended that I butted in, but then he asked where we parked. Right in front of the store. I got it. I said. I pull Cat to the Jeep to make sure we walk behind him. As soon as we get into the car, I then lock the doors and just try and keep from freaking out. We're not going. This doesn't feel right. What about the lingerie? I say. Literally everything I say, she has an excuse for it. We pull out of the parking lot and I follow Jack's SUV, but the whole time I'm just trying to figure out how to get the hell out of this. Cat doesn't like lingerie, but this could be a door for her, and she desperately needs the money. I mean, what if it is legit, though? He was alone anyways. You have your knife and pepper spray, right? She asked. Of course I do, but I'm five foot two to this man's six foot three, and Jack could very much have friends. And I mean, I don't want to possibly kill or be killed. I realize now Cat is totally bad shit. We drive along as I try to talk to her, and we start driving out into the desert, pretty much the middle of absolute nowhere. I notice that there's a divider in the road that prevents U-turns, and I get a really eerie feeling that Jack knew to take us this way. I'm absolutely desperate at this point. I pull out my phone and snap a picture of Jack's SUV license plate. I upload it to Snapchat where all of my friends can see it. Cat starts getting uncomfortable once she then realizes how far we've driven. The name of the place he mentioned springs back into my head, and I know it's familiar from somewhere. A commercial jingle that was distant but catchy. It's a restaurant or hotel or something. He wouldn't have a studio there. Please just look it up. I tell Cat. So she does, and guess what? It's a casino. Now, unless this man had rented out a space, he wouldn't have a studio there. With the information he gave us, it was totally inconsistent. Cat is totally freaked out at this point. I tell her that this really isn't uncommon and he was trying to confuse us the entire time. Throughout the entire interview, she had a confused and hesitant look on her face like this wasn't what she was promised or expecting at all. 
Cat finally agrees that we need to get the hell out of here, and I start to breathe easy again. I notice that every five or so minutes, there's a break in the medians. It's a rough quick stop and turn around, but it'll just have to do. So I do, and we absolutely gun it. Cat gets a call from Jack, and at first she ignores it. I convince her to call back, but nothing. It was like the number had blocked her, or it just didn't go through. I then tell her to screenshot the ad on Craigslist, but she can't find it anywhere. It's like every trace of Jack just magically disappeared. We go back to Kat's apartment, and I tell her she needs to report it immediately. She promises she will, but she'll do it later, because she doesn't want her husband to know. He didn't even know that she had this interview to begin with, and she didn't want him to know what happened. If I hadn't driven her, she would have gone alone, without ever telling a single soul, and who knows what could have happened. I tried not to scold her too badly, but I just wanted to remind her that our city was very different from where she's from. It's really dangerous out here. So, sweet cat, I hope you're a little more awakened to the world, and I'm really sorry for that. It's been a few months since we split ways, and I'm still worried to death over all the oblivious crazy things that you get into. Since this incident, I've now upgraded the three pepper sprays, and I now have a new pocket knife that I can carry around everywhere. I'm almost four months pregnant, and I'm now finally ready to get the hell out of this dangerous city. Please everyone, be safe out there, and be damned careful with Craigslist. And to Jack, if you're really the scary guy that my gut deemed you to be, screw you, and let's definitely not encounter each other ever again. And again, guys, please be careful everywhere and anywhere, and always, always trust your gut. Perhaps I'm overreacting, but something happened today that I want to share and hear your thoughts on. A friend had forwarded me a Craigslist ad for some dolls with a decent amount of extras for $50, an exceptionally good price for how much stuff it was. I sent an email back but got no response, so I just thought, oh well, someone probably beat me to it I guess. At 9.45pm, I then got an email back that then said, Sorry, I've been out all day today. Where can you pick it up? Sent from an iPhone. I responded, I could pick it up tomorrow. What time and where do you want to meet at? Got no response, so I went to bed. The next morning, I was really dragging from the time change, so I didn't really check my email until about 10 a.m. There was an email from the person that then said, I waited at the chapel school for about 10 minutes and you're not here, so I'm gonna leave. Once again, sent from an iPhone. I write back that I'm really sorry, but that I didn't get any emails last night before going to bed, and I literally just got up, so I didn't know I had an appointment. I'm happy to come by your home if that's convenient. It's only a 30 minute drive for me. She emails me back saying it's fine and that we can meet in an hour at the school. I decided to Google it and find that there's actually two chapel schools in the town. So I sent another email asking which one it is. Deafening silence. Now, since I had already stood her up once and potentially missed out on this really fantastic deal, I was going. So I jumped in my car and sent another email, saying which school that I picked from the two that I listed and that I was on my way. I get there and it's the weekend, so the school is obviously going to be closed. I never got an email back specifying which exact school it was, so I was just really hoping I was at the right one. Within about five minutes, a black SUV pulls up next to me with a really pleasant looking couple in their late thirties and two large dogs in the back seat. The man is driving, and he stays in the driver's seat. The woman gets out, holding a really large closed box. She says that if I want to, I can look through it first, as I was handing her the $50. The woman is still talking, and we're standing at the right front fender of her SUV. I can see the guy now get out of the car and walk to the back of the vehicle. I thought that maybe he was just checking on the dogs from the back hatch, but no. He walks around the rear of the vehicle and then comes up behind me in my blind spot. I kind of just turned to look at him with a really startled look because I just really thought it was odd. 
He has this really blank looking half smile on his face and he won't make eye contact. My skin started to crawl. I got that really sinking feeling deep in the pit of my stomach. I then became acutely aware that there was not another soul around us. There's literally no reason for him to have gotten out of the car and come up behind me like that. The transaction was over. They had effectively trapped me right between the two vehicles. I threw the box in my car while keeping an eye on the guy and bolted the hell out of there. If his intent was just to keep his wife safe during the transaction, why did he wait until the money had been exchanged to get out of the car? And why go the long way around the whole car just to come up behind me when the shortest distance to his wife was around the front where we were closest to? Who goes to the trouble of loading two really big dogs in an SUV for a three minute ride? I honestly really think the dogs were meant to be a distraction, but I'm not really sure. I honestly wonder if this was a dry run for a kidnapping and then they just got cold feet when they saw I wouldn't be an easy target. It was seriously creepy. Now, I'm not the type of person who sees danger behind every tree, but there was definitely something off about the whole thing. Anyway, I'm really fortunate that I got away okay, but I still can't help but wonder what they were actually planning to do. Maybe it's for the best that I never find out. Back in early of 2014, I was 18 years old and started browsing the world of Craigslist. I had responded to an ad in the personal section and then I started texting this woman. Now, being 18 years old and unfamiliar with how Craigslist actually works, I didn't really see an issue with meeting her up on a red roof. I also didn't really think there was anything wrong with her asking for donations. Again, 18 years old and really stupid. I figured donation meant optional. Again, stupid I know, but just to be clear, she never gave me an actual price nor did I tell her I had the money for her. So I set up a time to go meet her. I left my house to head to my GED class as usual, but walked to the red roof instead. It was pouring rain out and it was really warm, so by the time I got there I was all drenched and really sweaty. I knocked on the room door that she was in and then she answered. Her attire itself should have really alerted me, but let's say it again. 18 years old and really stupid. She invited me in and I asked if I could use the shower real quick. So I get undressed in the bathroom and hop in the shower and then she started taking off her top and then I told her, that's okay, I won't be long. So she then goes and waits on the bed while watching Steve Wilco's. I then get out of the shower and wrap a towel around me. I came out of the bathroom, then looked at her and I asked if she was ready. She sprawled out on the bed and then she says, Donations are due up front. At this point, all of the red flags that should have gone off did as I then realized the situation I was in. My face then dropped as I faced the TV. I nervously told her that I didn't have any money. She then got up and then she started screaming at me and then she threw my clothes and bag at me. I got dressed and I actually apologized for wasting her time. So I leave her room and I start heading back to my GED class. Before I was even out of the parking lot, a guy in a green car calls me over to him. I tried to ignore him and just walked past him until he then shouted to get my attention. So I then walked up to the driver's side of this guy's car and then he starts talking to me. Now, this guy looked absolutely sketchy, and I figured he was just the woman's pimp or something. So, he's now talking to me with his left arm up on his door and his right arm down at his side, and he's actually holding a freaking pistol. At this point, I'm almost certain that I'm going to get shot. He says to me, So, why would you come here knowing you don't have any money? I explained as calmly as I could that I really wasn't aware of the situation. The guy pulls up his freaking arm a little bit to show me his gun, and then he says, I have messages between you two saying you have money for her. Now, like I said earlier, I never once told this woman that I had any money for her. So this guy decides to lower his gun, and then he says to me, You're really lucky you came to one of my girls. Other girls would have stabbed you with a broken crack pipe. I see you're pretty young, 
so I'll let you off with a warning this time. He then began motioning me to be on my way, but you can bet your ass that I kept looking behind me, just to make sure that I wasn't about to be shot from behind. After that happened, I never met up with anyone from Craigslist ever again. My wife and I were looking for a used car on Craigslist, and we actually found one we were really interested in. We contacted the seller and told him we could meet him at a very public mall in about an hour. He then responded that he wouldn't be available until after he got off work at 5. So we agreed to meet him at the mall at 5.30. We arrive at the mall a little early, and we soon get a text that he's running late. So we wait and wait and wait, and then finally get a text from him saying he'll be there around 6.30, and that he should really be getting there really soon. This was in late fall, so it was already getting dark, and we were really starting to worry that the mall wouldn't be as busy soon. A little while later, he sends a text that we should meet him at another address about 30 minutes away, in a much more dangerous area of the city. I look up the address, and I see that it's a casino and gas station right off the interstate. I figured it would still be pretty busy around 7, so we head over. We pull into the parking lot, but I don't see the car. My wife finally says, Is that it? And then she points to a mid-size SUV hatchback. From the way it looked, it seemed like it was the right car, but it was in a really dark part of the parking lot. It was actually squeezed right between some parked 18-wheelers. Now, as two really small petite women, we were very wary of going over there. We locked the doors and then drove over. It was definitely the car, but it was parked in the darkest, most reclusive, least visible spot in the entire parking lot, with the hatch wide open. No lights were on inside of the car, and there was no one around or in the car. I stopped for a couple of seconds to see if someone would come and greet us, and when no one did, I just drove away. I had parked under the casino sign right next to the entrance of the parking lot, and then I texted the guy my location. He responded with, I'm right over here by the semis. Come on over. We pretty much left right away. It was just way too weird. I don't know what he was planning or if he was actually even going to sell us the car, but I'm really glad I never found out. A couple of years ago, I moved with my family right before I started college. Unfortunately for me, it was kind of far from the university that I'd been accepted to, so I had really been trying to find a place that was really close to my university. My dad had helped me and he showed me an ad that he found on Craigslist. There was a really nice looking house for rent and it was pretty close to my university. I decided to set up a meeting and go check the place out. I showed up in the afternoon and unfortunately, I was all alone. My dad said that I was an adult and a big guy, so I shouldn't really be worried about meeting this guy. This really old man then greeted me, and then he says, You're gonna have to follow me to get to the house for rent. I was really confused, and then said, Your ad said this was the house for rent. Why do I have to go somewhere else? He then says, This is my house. I'll take you to the one that's for rent. I'm a little concerned at this point, but followed him to his other place. I figured if things didn't look right, I could always just leave. We get there and I notice the house looks really bad and it looked like people were in it. I also want to add that I didn't see any other cars around, so this seemed really odd to me. He looks at me and then he says, Don't you want to check it out? Uh, I don't know. This isn't what was in your ad, and it looks like there's other people here. He tells me that it's just other people that are checking it out as well, and I could just join them. Something just felt really weird about this entire thing, and I told him I wasn't interested anymore. This place looked like it was in really bad shape from the outside, and it appeared to have a lot of people inside of the house. When he asked me why I wasn't interested, I told him that it was just too far of a drive for school and work. He then got mad at me and then accused me of wasting his time. I said, I'm not the one advertising a house and then telling the person that it's not the one for rent. He began to nervously glance towards the house and he asked if I was sure that I didn't want to check it out. 
I told him no and then left. Thankfully, he never contacted me again after that. I'm not really sure what his intentions were, but something just felt really wrong. Maybe he really was just trying to show me the house, but I really didn't like that he lied to me about the house to begin with and that there were also other people inside of it. I'm really not sure what was going on there, but I didn't really want to find out. I also really didn't like how he kept looking at the house when he was asking if I was sure that I didn't want to check it out. It seemed really bizarre to me how he went from being mad at me to getting kind of desperate for me to go inside of it. I don't know. The whole thing was just really weird. Technically, this isn't my own story, it's my mother's, but I am slightly involved in it. This happened when I was around three, possibly four, since it was in the summer. My parents and I had just moved into a new house in a really safe neighborhood in order to raise me. Basically, they were looking for new 60s themed furniture for our new house, so my mother went to Craigslist to try and find some. She eventually reached out to a man that was selling an older couch. She had just taken me out of preschool before going to his house, so I was in the car with her. Now, my mother is generally a very intelligent woman, although I will admit, her being a first-time mother, this really wasn't the best idea. She had left me in the car because she didn't think it would take too long. The man was standing outside of the house, and according to her, he seemed like a completely average guy, probably in his late 40s. He claimed that the couch was in his basement and that they would have to go down there in order to get it. Apparently, the couch that he showed her was completely different than the one placed in the ad, so she then turned around to ask him about it. He was sweating out of his mind, and he then started asking her a bunch of really creepy questions. Are you a virgin? How old are you? Are you married? My mother quickly left after that, and she claims that he actually chased after her. She then drove away as quickly as possible. To this day, my mom actually believes that he was going to hit her over the head and then try and sell her or something. I don't know for sure, but it's definitely a pretty creepy story nonetheless. This happened a few years ago, but it still really bugs me to this day. I had just graduated high school, and as a broke soon-to-be college student, I needed some extra cash. So I then took to selling all of my prom dresses on Craigslist. I received a phone call from someone who took interest in one of my dresses, so of course I answered it. Hello, I was calling about the blue dress that you posted on Craigslist. I was a little surprised at the fact that it was a raspy man's voice saying this, but I didn't really think too much of it. I had told him the size and the price of it. Nothing too crazy. He said that he and his mother were going on a cruise soon, and that they really needed fancy cocktail attire for an event on the cruise, which isn't that uncommon. So he was calling about the dress for his mother. Then he started asking questions. Which at first, I wasn't too concerned with, because if I were buying something that pricey, I probably would too. Here's a list of the questions that he had asked me in order, and then my responses. What size is the dress? Um, it's about an 8, but it fits more like a 6. How does it fit, you know, up top? Um, normally? I bought it in my size, so I mean, it fits me like it normally would. What size bra do you wear? Um, I'm sorry, but that isn't really relevant. Well, I was just wondering. For my mom, you know. Yeah, well, your mom should probably know what size dress she wears before she shops for them. Is it a tight dress? Like, was it really tight on you? Can I see pictures of you wearing it? I can't even form a sentence before he continues on. And what about panties? Would my mother be able to wear panties? <laughs> I mean, if you even wore any with it. I imagine you didn't. Your voice is so seductive and slutty. Are you a slut? <laughs> At this point, I was so appalled that I couldn't even get the words out of my mouth. Everything that he said came so fast. I quickly told him that he was really disgusting and to never call me again. I deleted and blocked that number, deleted the post about the dress, and also my entire Craigslist account. So yeah, 
I really don't think that I'll ever get back on Craigslist. I'm a 19 year old female. I went into the movie theater alone about two days ago because I had no one to go with. Right away, I knew something was wrong because a man was sitting in the seat that I just paid $16 to reserve. I really didn't want to confront him about my seat, so I just sat a few seats away from him. During the trailers, he had looked at me for a few minutes and when I couldn't ignore him anymore, I looked back at him to see what he wanted. He started to put his hand towards me and then said hey. I don't know why, but I shook his hand because I kind of have issues saying no to people. Something that I'm really working on after this incident. He went on to ask me so many personal questions, but the very first one was, Are you here alone? I should have known right then and there that he was a creep right after that question. I told him yes because I didn't really know what else to say. And plus, I mean, it was pretty obvious. He then went on to ask me what my name was, what college I went to, and why I was here all alone. I answered all of his questions because I just couldn't really think of any lies on the spot. I was frozen. Then he asked me if I wanted a beer. I'm 19 years old and I actually look pretty young, so he had to have known I was underage. I mean, why would he ask a girl who looked like an underage teenager if she wanted a beer? But anyways, I told him no because I've heard so many horror stories of men drugging women and I didn't want to be under the influence around strangers like this guy. When he left to go buy his beer at the concession stand, I moved away from the seat and sat in another row. I was hoping he would finally get the hint and just leave me alone already. When he came back though, he looked for me and sat right next to me. I was frozen yet again. I was terrified. I didn't know why he kept sitting next to me or what his intentions were. The theater was fairly empty and there was only about three other people there. By this point, the movie had started, but he just kept talking to me. The man started whispering to me because I guess he didn't want the other people there to try and shush him or tell him to shut the hell up. I was way too scared to try and get up and move because I didn't know how he would react if I did that. Would he hold my arm down? Would he try and trap me? Would he get violent? I just didn't know. Then he did something so gross that I haven't been able to forget it since it happened. He started to lean his body right towards me and then whispered into my ear, Hey, don't make it weird. Let's hold hands. The man started to hover his hands right over my lap and pretty much just watched me until I shook my head no at him. That's when I got up and he then asked me, Where are you going? And I told him I was going to the bathroom. And that's when I ran away into the bathroom where I started to have a panic attack. I realize now that it was really stupid of me to tell him where I went because he could have just followed me there and trapped me there. I know much better than to do that now. I spent the next 15 minutes inside of the bathroom just pretty much panicking about what happened and what I should do next. I was way too scared to leave the bathroom stall because I really didn't know if he was waiting outside for me or what he was going to do. I was really worried that none of the employees would help me because I mean technically he didn't even touch me, but still. He was being super creepy and I didn't really know how to handle it. Well, when I left for the bathroom, he was there, waiting for me. He basically started yelling at me for leading him on. He said that I shouldn't have worn so much makeup and looked like I did if I didn't want his attention. The man started following me around and started to insult me and calling me a tease until I finally found an employee that was willing to help. The employee was probably just some poor teenager, but he did actually help me. He told the creep to stop following me and to go with him to speak to the manager. I wish that I had stayed longer to speak with the manager too, but once the guy stopped following me, I booked it out of there. I went back to my dorm where I locked myself in there all night long. Every time I see a man who resembles him, I have another panic attack because I think it's the same person and that he might want to hurt me. This is the first time that I've ever been this scared. Hopefully I don't have any creepy encounters in the movie theaters moving forward. At least, I really hope not. Back when I was in high school, my friends and I would really love to go to our local movie theater that was situated inside of our shopping mall. 
We usually traveled in really big groups, but this time it was only my friend Alex and I. We had picked a late night showing of some obscure movie. I can't really recall the name because this happened a long time ago, but we arrived on time to find our seats. Since the showing was so late and the movie wasn't really a box office hit, the theater was empty. We had situated ourselves in the middle where we could get a perfect view of the screen. Strangely enough, a couple that arrived late decided to sit in our row, with only two seats between us and them. My friend and I kind of exchanged really confused looks, but then just shrugged it off, figuring that it was solely because we had prime viewing seats. As the theater started to get dark, things got a little weird. The woman of the couple kept looking over at us every few minutes. The first few times, I figured she was just a nervous person and just adjusting to her surroundings. Yet, maybe about an hour into the movie, she just kept doing it. She wasn't even discreet with her staring because she had turned her head completely towards us. Like I could literally see her entire face. I can still see it in my head to this day. I nudged my friend and I told him about the girl that was staring, and he whispered back to me that he'd noticed it too. At this point, I was feeling very anxious and I almost wanted to leave the movie early. My friend didn't want to though, so I decided that staying with him was probably safer than leaving alone. And I was also his ride home, so it wouldn't really make sense to do that. Throughout the entire movie, the girl just continued to look over at us. Every now and then she'd whisper something to her counterpart, but he himself never looked over. Once the movie finally ended, I grabbed my friend by the arm and told him that we should get going immediately because it's getting pretty late. He followed sweet as I sprinted out of the theater. Once we were out, the halls were pretty empty because of the fact that barely any films play towards the end of the night. I was just about to say something to my friend about how the couple next to us really freaked me out, but then they ran out of the door literally seconds right after us. On the inside, I was totally freaking out, but decided to try my best to keep my composure. My friend was definitely aware of them closely following us out of the theater, but he really isn't the type to be confrontational, so we decided to just speed walk to my car. Once we got in the car, my intuition was just screaming at me just to get out of the parking garage as fast as I could. I saw the weird couple making it to their blue car, which happened to be on the same parking garage level of us. That wasn't really surprising because the entrance to the mall was on that level, so pretty much everyone parks there. I sped out of the parking garage and drove towards the main street. I told my friend to keep a lookout and see if their blue car was following us. He looked back and, to my surprise, he said that the coast was clear. I kid you not, I felt so relieved. Now, we were the only ones on the main highway because it was really late at night and we lived in a really quiet suburban area. Then a few minutes later, a car came speeding up from behind us and flashed their high beams at me. My heart started to race and my head just told me that it was them. I had asked Alex if the car was blue but he said he couldn't really tell. The light to turn left onto the main street was green so I took the left turn to get to his neighborhood. The car backed off and then turned on normal lights but still turned left too. I caught a glimpse of the car and that's when I started yelling once I realized that it was indeed the weird couple's blue car. Alex told me to gun it, so I slammed down on the gas and sped down the last main street before I had to turn into his neighborhood. The blue car wasn't tailgating me, but it was clearly following not too far behind. When the streets are pretty empty, it's really easy to follow someone since there aren't any other cars to dodge. I turned into Alex's neighborhood but decided to drive past the streets so that they wouldn't see where we were trying to go. That's when the blue car then followed us into the quiet neighborhood and was then picking up speed to get closer to us. Alex started to panic and he started asking me what I was going to do. I just kept quiet as I then started to speed down a random street in a neighborhood. I could see the car lights behind me as I made a turn into another street, but they were far enough so that they couldn't see me for about another 30 seconds after I took the next turn. After I turned into another unfamiliar street, I turned my car off and then flipped it into neutral. My car is a manual, so I'm very familiar with driving it and I knew I had enough momentum to roll into an empty parking spot even though my car was off. 
I slipped into a spot in the curb and pushed the brakes to get to a stop before the blue car could clear the turn to get into the street. I reclined my seat completely all the way back and told Alex to lean all the way forward and don't move. We pretty much just sat there in the silent and dark car, my ears just ringing from how quiet it was. My heartbeat was fluttering faster than it ever had before. I think that it was a mix of fear and adrenaline. Within about a few seconds, the blue car cleared the turn and then started slowly driving down the street. It started to make its way past my car that was parked on the side of the street. Luckily for us, I drive a pretty standard black Scion TC. There's pretty much nothing notable about the car. I haven't even changed the license plate frame. So they must have thought that the cars parked on the road belonged to the people in the neighborhood. Alex and I literally stayed in our hiding positions for about 10 minutes, just in case the weird couple decided to drive by again. However, luckily for us, they never did. Once we got up, we just stared at each other and didn't really know what to say. We were both really freaked out and really had no idea what the couple had planned to do if they had caught up to us. To this day, I still have no idea what their intentions were. Maybe they're just a couple of deviants who really enjoy freaking out young high school students. Or maybe they actually had some kind of sinister plan for us. All I know is that I don't go to the movie theater late at night anymore. That is, unless I'm with a really big group of friends. That's literally the only time I'll ever go at night. Be careful out there. When I was eight, my parents got divorced, and for years after that, my dad would take me to the movies. We're both movie fans, and I loved just hanging out with my dad, since he had me on the weekends. He would take my two cousins too, since it was really a blast because I liked hanging out with them, and going to the movies with all three of them was really fun. We went to the movie theater all the time. We called it The Cheap Show, since it had older movies like ones that weren't yet released on DVD, but they were out of regular theaters already. It was kind of run down, old movie theater, and the floor was never cleaned. The food came in bundles with the tickets for $5, and it just looked gross inside, hence the cheap show. Love that place though. What ruined it for me was this one experience. We had been going there for years. I was 10 at the time, and before every movie, it was my dad's rule that we'd always go to the bathroom. Me, being the rebel I am, decided I didn't need to go, since while my dad and my two cousins went into the men's bathroom, I waited outside. I remember feeling really good about myself that day. I was wearing this new hoodie, with these colorful hearts on it, and I just felt like I was proud of my appearance that day. I guess someone else thought so too, because two grown-ass men walk over to me because I was standing in front of the bathrooms. I didn't think anything of it until they stopped right in front of me. They're both staring at me, just standing there. And being a shy kid, I got nervous. But they didn't give me any bad vibes right off the bat. I always read on here about being naive and not feeling off about someone, and I understand it completely, because I didn't feel anything bad from them. They were just two guys going to see a movie and I was standing by the bathrooms. So, one of the men finally says something to me. He moves in front of me, a little to my personal space, and says, Excuse me, how old are you? My birthday was coming up soon, so despite being 10, I answered 11. For some reason, I wanted to be older for these two grown men, like they would somehow like me more for being a year older than I was. I didn't even know them, so why was this a big deal for me? I have no clue. One of the guys is silent, the other one's doing all the talking. He says something that immediately triggered that feeling of something is right the F off. You got a boyfriend? I swallowed hard and the anxiety in my stomach skyrockets into just the verge of straight panic. I stutter out a no. In response, just trying to answer honestly. I still don't know why. He seemed very happy with my response. Like, really happy with it. This awful, creepy, like, flirting grin came up on his face. It was like the guy was flirting in a movie or something. That upturned eyebrow, and the one-sided, teeth-bearing smile. The other guy just had a straight face behind him. His eyes trained on me as I start to squirm under the gaze. 
I was so uncomfortable with these two. Do you want one? At this question, my fight or flight response goes off. The flight part makes me fling myself into the woman's restroom. The thought was so quick through my head. All it was was if I go into the girl's bathroom, they can't follow me in there because they're boys. It wasn't even a second before I'd had that thought, and I was in the girl's bathroom. I'm honestly still surprised at my infallible logic that they couldn't just possibly walk into the bathroom behind me because they weren't women. I want to say that I pushed myself against the door, holding it shut with my small body, but I didn't. I just assumed that those rules couldn't be broken. They wouldn't possibly break them, but surprisingly, they didn't follow me. I paced and paced around the bathroom and washed my face in the sink. I didn't know what to do. I was panicking. I just wanted my dad, but the same logic that I thought was keeping those two men out of the bathroom was keeping me from running to my dad in the men's bathroom. When I heard the door to the men's bathroom open and close, I chanced to peek out the door and saw my dad standing there with my two cousins. I immediately ran to him and hugged him tight. My dad, being the joker he still is, asked if I'd washed my hands before getting my grubby mitts all over him. I ignored his joke, even though it managed to make me feel a little better. Just knowing he was there and told him what had happened while he was in the bathroom, my dad got pissed. Info about my dad, he's scary when he's pissed. And my dad was pissed a lot before the divorce. So, seeing him mad because of something I said made me really upset and anxious. Point them out to me. My dad's voice is low now. Not anything like when he's joking around like he usually is. I do as he says and point the two guys. They're at the snack bar buying snacks, and they don't seem to notice me. But I hide behind my dad nevertheless. I'm gonna say something to them. At this point, I started to beg my dad not to. Not only because I didn't want to go anywhere near them, but for some reason, I didn't want them to get in trouble with my dad. In my head, I somehow justified it that they could have been my age, or just a little older. They were clearly in their mid to late 20s, to early 30s. And I know now, but as a kid, I always thought people were younger than they were. Also, I was a tall kid, and the man who spoke was short, so I figured he could have been my age. Now I know that's not the case, but back then, I didn't know. After listening to me beg for about a minute, my dad resigned not to confront them. I breathed a sigh of relief, and he asked if I wanted to leave. My cousins protested, and I wanted to see the movie too, so I refused to leave. My dad let us stay. As we're walking to our movie, though, they were walking the other way towards the bathrooms. I put my hood up and hid by my dad and my cousins. I felt their gaze on me as I passed. I didn't see them on the way out. To this day, I no longer wait for anyone outside the bathroom. And to the guys who scared me out of that, let's not meet again. Back when I was in high school, my friends and I really loved exploring creepy places. A few of us had our driver's license, so on weekend nights we would always gather a group of about 6 to 10 people and go on an adventure. One summer, our favorite place to go to was this abandoned movie theater on the west end of town. The place had closed down probably about three years before we started visiting it, and during that time it had become a really run-down building. There were no trespassing signs on the front entrance and each of the fire exits around the building. The glass at the main entrance was all broken and had been boarded up. The front door was totally busted and didn't have a latch or lock, so people were able to get inside. We knew that there were probably some homeless people that were crashing in there, but we were young and dumb and felt like an invincible group. I think that's a really big part of what made it scary. We would always wait until between 11pm to 2am to go into places like this because we didn't want anyone to see or hear us and report us to the police. We all explored it together the first two times that we went in. The screens and the seats were all torn up inside each of maybe the eight rooms that were there. The bathroom mirrors were totally broken and there was graffiti everywhere. We were fairly sure that there were people hiding in there while we were inside even though we never saw anyone the first two times we went. There were a couple of shopping carts from a nearby Fred Meyer inside, 
and there was cans and bottles in them and a few dirty blankets scattered around in different rooms. It looked pretty lived in. After getting to know the layout of the place the first couple of trips, we made a game of it for the third and final visit. This time, the six of us that went split into three groups of two, and with our partner, the two of us would enter the front together and spend a full five minutes inside, while the others waited outside at our chosen exit in the back of the building. The first two, Beck and Doug, both went in while we waited outside. About seven minutes went by and, just as we were starting to worry that we should go in after them, they made it out the other side through the fire exit. Doug told us that they went upstairs into the office and that there was a sleeping bag that hadn't been there on the last visit, and as soon as they went up and saw it, they tried to leave immediately, but they got turned around and then tried to leave through the wrong exit, which was sealed shut. They were getting really paranoid that they were being followed out, so they pretty much just stood there watching the way that they entered the theater room for about a minute, making sure that they didn't hear any noises before they finally worked up the nerve to run out of the right exit right across the hallway. Doug and Beck really both wanted us all to leave, but Jack and I weren't having that, and we insisted on going in. Brad and Drew, the other group of two that was going to go in last, wanted to come with us, so the four of us went inside while Beck and Doug both waited by the exit. The first thing we all wanted to do when we got inside was go check out the upstairs office. And just as we started to make our way up the stairs, we all then heard a really loud banging sound. It was coming from the back of the theater. We all agreed that it had to be Beck and Doug trying to scare us so that we would come out and then leave. We got upstairs and the pounding stopped. Doug was right. There was a sleeping bag rolled out on the ground with a few paper bags set up around it. Brad had flashed a light in one of them and saw a syringe and something that looked like a vibrator. We were all pretty grossed out, but we just had a little laugh about it. We had looked around while we were up there and didn't really notice anything else interesting, and we were starting back down the stairs when the pounding then started right back up again. That's when we decided that we should probably make our way to the exit. I was really just hoping that we hadn't been caught trespassing by the police. We came out through the exit and pretty much immediately, both Doug and Beck then told us that about a minute after we entered the theater, a really tall, creepy, homeless looking man with really greasy hair walked right past them heading for the entrance. Beck had said hello as he passed and the guy stopped, turned, and then kind of lunged a few inches toward him before stopping. One side of his face was really wrinkly. Beck seemed to think that maybe he was a burn victim or something, but he wasn't really sure. The guy had stared at him, then without even saying anything, then turned and walked around the corner where we had gone inside. They started pounding on the door right after he was out of sight to try and warn us that there was a really scary dude in there with us. We were all in there for about five minutes with this guy and we never saw him. He had to have heard us and then hid somewhere. We started to walk back to our car in the Fred Meyer parking lot when a car pulled into the parking lot and shined its headlights on us, right before flashing its red and blues. The police officer had us all sit down in front of the spotlight that was in front of his car and asked us what we were doing. We told him we were going to head inside the movie theater, but a really scary tall guy walked in and we really chickened out. He told us that it was really dangerous to go into places like this, as there had been a lot of violence in the building before, and it'd be a real shame if we somehow got hurt doing something stupid. He eventually let us go, and as we drove off, we saw him shining a light inside of the front entrance. We took the officer's advice, and we never went back there ever again. I never did find out what violence he was talking about, though. It could have just been a tactic to scare us out of ever coming back. I'm not really sure. After this event, we pretty much only stuck to graveyards and cemeteries. So did the creepy dude that lives in condemned buildings. I'm really glad I never actually met you, but I want to thank you for getting me out of a ticket for trespassing. And I want to thank everyone else that was hiding in that building for not assaulting me or my friends. I'm really thankful nothing bad happened. Before I tell you this story, I really need to make some things clear. I'm a 20-year-old female and was going through a pretty rough breakup during this time, 
and I was in a pretty bad emotional place off and on. This largely contributed to how I put myself into this situation. This is more or less a cautionary tale on how you should always be careful who you talk to over text, though you've probably heard it at least a thousand times. Anyways, let's get to it. I received a random text one night from a number I didn't know that simply said, Hey yo. A little puzzled, I look at the text and try to see if there was any hint on who this person was. So I said, Um, who is this? He claimed that he had found me on Tinder and that's how he got my number. Now, this should have been a red flag because number one, I absolutely never posted my number on Tinder. And two, I haven't even used Tinder in months. Actually, more like a year. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's no way that my profile could have popped up somewhere if I wasn't active for such a long time. However, being heartbroken and horny, I saw this as an opportunity to make a new friend, and possibly even more. And, well, I was all for it. So, I had asked for this person's name. His name was apparently John which is what I'll start referring to him as from here on out. We exchanged some texts and John eventually sent me a few photos of himself. Now, just to be on the safe side, I did reverse search his images on Google, but nothing came up. So, I just assumed that I was safe here. I sent him a few pictures of myself as well. Thankfully, none were anything lewd. In retrospect, he was really, really vague about himself. Any time that I would ask him questions about his life, he would just give one-worded responses, and that would be that. However, I just kind of chalked it off as someone who wasn't great at talking about themselves. A few days go by, and we're talking off and on. We didn't really chat that constantly, just the occasional hellos and how are yous. Then one day, he asked if I wanted to meet him up at an in and out the nearest in and out location was about 30 minutes away from my house, but I didn't really mind making the drive. This was around the same time that we had sent some flirty texts to each other. So of course, this made me really excited, and I decided to go. Boy, was that a big-ass mistake. Actually, I think I made more than one big-ass mistake. Another big-ass mistake was lying to my mom about who I was meeting up with. I had actually told her that I was going by myself. Why did I do that? I was afraid of being chastised, and I knew that my mom would probably demand a picture of John's ID as well as his number before letting me go. I just really didn't want to go through that hassle, but now I'm really glad that she does that. So I was on my way there, but as soon as I got in the car and started the engine, I started to have a really bad feeling. Now at first, I thought I was just feeling nervous. Maybe I was just being paranoid. Yeah, no. Always listen to that gut feeling, kids. It'll save you a lot of trouble in the long run. As I was driving, I stopped at a traffic light, and I noticed that John had then sent me some pictures and texts. They became increasingly strange, and the pictures became more and more NSFW. He had started joking around about trying to figure out my password for Snapchat, which happened to be the platform that we'd been talking on after exchanging our information on the regular messaging app. That's when my alarm bells totally started ringing. Still though, dumbass me just kept driving, figuring that I couldn't just turn back now, right? So I get to the in and out and it's totally packed. I'm talking about an entire line of cars filling up the drive through almost all the way back of this old parking lot. Next to the in and out is this small abandoned mall strip with an empty parking lot. Seeing that there was no room to park it in and out, I decided to park in that empty lot, since I mean, it was right next to the restaurant. However, once I turned off the engine, something just told me to stay the hell inside, and I'm so glad that I did. I text John to let him know that I'm here, and somehow that's when shit started going haywire. After stupidly telling him what car I drove, he then replied, basically saying something along the lines of, Alright, look, we don't want to hurt you but I got my boys surrounding you in the parking lot. Don't move until you give me your Snapchat information and password, and you'll be free to go after that. If you even try to get away, I'll have my boys come after you. To be completely honest, I was totally confused, but then that quickly transformed into me almost shitting myself as I then realized the situation I was in. 
I looked around me and I didn't see any cars surrounding me, but I wasn't about to take any chances. Instead of staying put, I slammed on the gas pedal and then hauled ass out of that parking lot at almost 40 miles before hitting the highway at 80 plus. Being scared out of my damn mind, I did the first smart thing in a while and called a close friend of mine from work. I told him the situation and being really afraid of the possibility of being followed home by these creeps, we agreed to meet at a McDonald's that was close to my house. This man is an absolute saint and I really don't know how he manages to put up with my crap, but I'm so grateful for what he did for me. We were in that McDonald's for probably a good hour. I was really starving but I couldn't really eat because of how anxious and stupid I felt. I felt so 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 stupid for how this whole thing happened. Plus. This psycho deadass called me from an unknown number three times while we were there. I actually started feeling really really bad for lying to my mom about it as well, and I ended up breaking down and pretty much confessing everything to her. Let's just say the mama bear in her came out a little too much. But after being at McDonald's, I had my friend follow me home just to be on the safe side. Funnily enough, him and my mom actually met each other for the first time that night. I have since blocked John from all of my contacts, but for the next few days after that, he actually had the audacity to call me off and on while I was at work. Thankfully I was smart enough not to answer them. Either that or I was just way too scared. Maybe it's a little bit of both. However, I think the creepiest part about this whole thing was the last thing he sent me before I blocked him. We can still see you. During my senior year of high school, I had started talking with this super hot emo punk kid named Brian on AIM. I was all in. I had just been dumped by my loser high school boyfriend and Brian was incredibly sweet and he always knew what to say. There were some red flags though for sure. Whenever I would finally convince him to send me a picture, he looked a little different in each photo. Like, they could have been pictures of different people, but looked similar enough. And the guy liner was on point, so I just accepted it. We also, like, never talked on the phone. I would always beg him to let me call him, but he always had an excuse for it. Finally, the summer before I left for college, he let me call him and his voice was, well, super weird. My friend was convinced that it was like a 50-year-old woman, but I was like, hell no, this has got to be Brian. I was so blinded that I actually ignored every warning sign. I had told Brian everything. He knew all of my passwords, everything about my day to day life, and literally everything about me. And literally every single one of my friends told me he wasn't real, that I needed to stop being a dumbass and just accept reality. But I honestly really did love him. During that fall, I left for college. My first roommate was a total wine bag who had a mile long list of rules for our room, so I was pretty desperate to bounce. I found out that there was an empty room and then requested a transfer for winter semester. Now I knew going in blind was a pretty big risk but it couldn't be worse than my last roommate. At the same time though, I was really loving everything else about college. Things with Brian kind of diminished because life was pretty busy and I just really wanted to experience everything aka other dudes. Brian would always call me like 20 times a day, message me all the time, and constantly barrage me about whether or not I had a Facebook, and he wanted the password to it. Um, hell no. I finally decided that I needed to break things off with him. The next semester, I then moved into my awesome new room. My roommate was a fellow freshman from Massachusetts who had transferred that semester. She was totally loaded. She pretty much brought basically everything we would need for the room. Her mom had actually got us matching bedding from Pottery Barn. It was pretty awesome. She was a little weird and she like always wanted to hang out the first week. But I figured it was just nerves or something. So the first weekend right after classes started, I was chilling with some of my friends in the quad area and she then comes over and throws her keys at me and then she says, I hope you have a lot of fun with these freaking losers. And I was pretty caught off by it. I ended up crashing at one of my girlfriend's rooms that night because I was really freaked out. The next day though, it was like nothing even happened. 
We had hung out that entire week and she was very perceptive and helpful. I was totally amped to have met what I thought would be my college bestie. The next weekend I convinced her to come out and we're having a blast, dancing with dudes and just generally having a really good time. And then things were escalating with me and this soccer jock, so I let her know that I was going to be bailing. We were about a two minute walk from the soccer house and we came with a group, so I just kind of figured it wasn't really a big deal. So I get back to our room later that night and I then see that crap is totally torn the hell up. Clothes ripped out of the closet, stuff all over the floor, everything was just a total wreck. She's sitting on my bed and her arm is bleeding. That's when I asked her what the hell was going on and why did she do all this. She had actually broken my coffee cup and carved my freaking initials into her arm. I run to get the RA because I'm not trying to get murdered tonight. On that night, she ended up getting committed and her parents flew down. Well, this is where shit got even weirder and totally hit the fan. As it turns out, she was Brian. She told her parents and they told me. So she slash he decided to try and start things with me like as her true self. Applied to my school and then called the housing department to request me as a roommate. Then emailed housing for my email and requested her as my roommate and then deleted the emails. Her parents apologized, said that I could keep all of the stuff in the room and then they left. Shortly after I got a no contact order. So yeah, that's pretty much the craziest story of my life. So let's take a nice stroll down memory lane. Back to the days of You've Got Mail and Tiki Room chat rooms. I remember my friends and I could dick around for hours on AIM, just messing around with people and creating these vanity friendships and relationships. Sometimes I often wonder how many pedophiles that we actually talked to when we really thought we were talking to some hot Volcom wearing skater named Derek that loved the same kind of bands as we did. But I digress. The thing is, we knew we were never going to meet these people, and we knew that it was just all a fantasy. However, I don't think my grandmother got that memo. So I was in the seventh grade when all of this happened, and at the time, I thought it was pretty hilarious. Now as an adult, I'm pretty concerned. My grandmother loved her AOL. She had a pretty big fascination with angels. I distinctly remember her username being Angel Dust 2. I remember this because I would get so annoyed that everything always had something to do with angels. And I mean constantly. Anyhow, while she was loving her angels in the Bible, she was also loving the chat rooms. I also like to think that she initially just went on there just to make friends and talk to people that liked the same things as she did. However, I also think that she just wasn't fulfilled with her regular life. At some point during her online chat room journey, she had met a guy named Seth. Seth was just your average high school senior from what I had been told. He lived a few states away, was 17 years old, good looking, played sports, and an all around guy's guy. My grandma was 48 at the time, but was passing herself off as a 22 year old named Dana. She even went as far as sending Seth photos of herself when she was actually 22 and not a 28 year old woman. To be completely honest, I'm not really sure how this very dated photo got past Seth, but either way, he seemed to buy it. In Dana's online fantasy, some people had starring roles. Her husband was her adopted brother, her mother was her adopted mom, and no one else seemed to exist. I remember going to my grandma's house one day and I had gone to her room just to say hi. Of course I'm like, hey grandma, and she threw a glass at me to get me to leave the room because she was on the phone. And I think we can all guess who she was on the phone with. Seth. Now, this is where it gets scary. Things are already pretty odd at this point, but out of the blue, one day my grandma took about $800 out of my great grandmother's savings account, got in her car, and then left for days. During this time, it's a bit fuzzy, but I don't recall her ever reaching out to say that she had made it to her destination. No one actually knows where she exactly went, who she saw, or what actually even happened. A couple of days go by and we get a call from my grandmother. She told us that she stopped at a cousin's house in Tennessee and had a mental breakdown. 
Then she said she had stopped by my great uncle's house where she had yet again had another mental breakdown. However, none of this ever even happened. My mom had reached out to said cousin and uncle to try and get some answers, and everyone had stated that my grandma just never stopped in those areas. When she finally did come home, it was like seeing a totally different person. She told us that she did go see Seth and his friends, but the cops had chased her out of the state. Mind you, this guy lived a good 16 plus hours away from where we live, so that's a lot of ground to cover. Apparently, my mom had gotten Seth's information after snooping through my grandmother's room while she was away, and then proceeded to call Seth and his mom. His mom was aware of their friendship, but she also assumed that Dana was not who she said she was. Seth, on the other hand, well, he told my mom he really didn't want to see Dana and that he told her not to visit him. All the while, she's sending him handwritten love notes, an expensive pendant for his graduation, and that they had apparently planned on getting married. I think this was the first time in a really long time that my grandma felt something that was a bit more exciting than her mundane life, and the fantasy just took over and then became her real life. Over the next several years, though, things started to get really bizarre. She would cover her TV, windows, and mirrors because she was totally convinced that they were two-way mirrors. She wouldn't want me to visit her, she wouldn't want to have to open the front door, and she would just sit in the dark in the silence all the time. She had chugged a bottle of NyQuil and had to go to the hospital. All the while, she was just more concerned with Seth. She was actually admitted to various mental institutions as she started thinking that she was actually Dana. This all happened 17 years ago. To this day, the entire ordeal was just swept under the rug. No one knows and no one will ever know what actually happened to my grandma when she left for those days. She's now in her 60s and she still has her pretty wild moments. After this experience, she had actually told us years ago to never ever post photos online of her. Someone thought it would be a really good idea for her to get a Facebook and she was my friend on there. I abided by her rule of not posting photos of her and I don't have a single one on my profile. This made her incredibly angry and caused her to say a lot of unnecessary things to me. Unfortunately, because of this, we don't have a relationship. I honestly don't really know what to think. Somewhere along the way, my grandma just totally lost it. I honestly don't know if she'll ever return to her old self. I guess it just is what it is, though. So, I got really lucky with my random roommate draw in college. My roommate Mandy and I, well, ended up being best friends. We still are, although we live in different parts of the world, we keep in touch fairly often, and I know that I can always depend on her if I need her. Anyway, about two to three months into our freshman year, everything was going pretty well for us. We were going out together every weekend and both dating around. I knew that before we went to college she had been in a relationship, and she would still talk to her ex-boyfriend on and off. Her boyfriend Shane was in the military. At the time, I think he was stationed in Germany. Now, she didn't straight up say that he was abusive to her, and it even took her years later to admit that he was. But it was pretty obvious from her stories that he was a really scary guy. I don't think that he ever got physically violent with her, but I remember that she told me that one time he threatened her that if she ever cheated on him, that he would send black girls to her house with knives. Pretty weird and really racist, but I mean sending anyone to your house with knives is definitely pretty scary. Also, any time that she ever attempted to completely cut off contact with him and block his number or social media, he would always make hundreds of accounts and even email her to harass her. Obviously from what she told me, it was pretty clear to me that this guy was a complete piece of shit. I think Mandy talked to him online a lot more than she'd ever told me at this time, and he was in the background of my mind because I'd never actually met him, and I saw that she was seeing a few other guys at our college. About halfway through the year, we had stopped hanging out as much. Basically, there was a fight in our friendship group, and we took different sides. We weren't really mad at each other directly, but there was definitely a bit of a divide. Through the year though, I had met tons of people at parties whenever I was drunk and I didn't really remember all of them. As a result, if I saw someone friend request me on Facebook who went to my college, I just assumed I had already met them and then accepted it. One of the girls was named Vanessa. I don't remember exactly when she added me, 
but she slowly started messaging me and would ask what I was doing on the weekend. I wouldn't really reply too much because I had already had friends to go out with and I wasn't really too keen to meet up with people that I didn't even remember. Vanessa's photos were a bit more provocative. Nothing too out there, but just a little bit sexier than average. There was also another girl named Manny who added me. I didn't really remember her either, but she would message me from time to time and ask what I did for fun. From her profile, it didn't even look like she went to my college, but was going to go there the next semester. She looked a bit more innocent and basic. The total opposite from Vanessa. I thought that I was being nice and helpful by replying back to her, since she was going to be a new student there soon. One night, I was chilling and smoking weed with my friends when Vanessa sends me a message. She then says something like, Me and my man are in town. We have a hotel room. Want to meet up? I would actually be into having a threesome, but I was pretty sketched out since I didn't really know this girl or her boyfriend. So now I'm high as shit when suddenly this girl sends me about a hundred pictures of her sucking a dick. I was completely taken by surprise and totally disgusted. I mean, come on. No one likes an unsolicited dick pic. The weird part though was that every single one of them was the same picture. Not a bunch of different pictures, but literally 100 of the same picture. Then once I opened the photo, I realized that there was some kind of timeline thing like how you could see at the bottom of the screen when you're watching a show and then it shows how much time is left. So this was from a porn that someone paused then screenshot and then sit to me a hundred times. I was completely freaked out and then immediately blocked the bitch. I went back to my room and told my roommate all about it. We tried to brainstorm on who it might be that would try and catfish me and send me those photos. I was actually kind of worried that it might be the roommate who shared the suite with us. She was in her own room but we all shared a bathroom. She was really obese and had really weird pictures of herself on Facebook. She was always nice in person but we never really talked that much. Right when that happened, my roommate Mandy mentioned there was some weird shit on her toothbrush. So I thought that maybe this girl was trying to sabotage us or something. Then a couple of days later, Manny, the innocent Facebook girl who had been messaging me previously, then asks, So do you ever hook up with girls? And I immediately blocked her too. Another catfish. I'm pretty damn sure no real girl would actually say that. Later that same week, some other girl adds me on Facebook. I could tell pretty much straight away that it was definitely a fake account, but I decided to check out the profile and saw that all of her likes were all stuff to do with the military. Over the next few weeks, a bunch of obviously fake accounts tried to add me on Facebook and Instagram. Every single account had some similarities. They all had some sexy pictures, had some mention of the military, and were saying that they were lesbian or bi. The connection to the military is what really stuck out to me, and that's when I realized that it was probably Mandy's boyfriend. When I asked her about it, she admitted straight away that she thought it was him too. Apparently someone had been adding her from a ton of fake accounts as well. I think that she was just too embarrassed to say that it was probably him from the beginning. All of this happened between 2012 to 2013. Now I can spot a fake account from a mile away. I received friend requests from accounts that I could tell were Shane for years after that. He had a specific way of targeting certain people. He would always add the last 50 or so people you added so that when he requested or followed you, you saw that you had mutual friends and figured you knew each other. Apparently over time, he actually did that to all of Mandy's friends. And the crazy part? I'm apparently the only one that it didn't work on. Even her cousin, who was the same age as us, ended up sending naked photos to him, disguised as girls online. Mandy and I have talked about it a lot, and she thinks it's his sick way of trying to tell her who her real friends are. He has two kids now with some other girl now, and he'll still sometimes message Mandy from a fake account, but will literally never admit that it's him whenever she calls him out. The dude is definitely a psycho but hopefully I don't hear from him or his crazy shenanigans ever again. About two years ago, right around Halloween, I was babysitting for these two ladies who each had a son. They wanted to go out, so I stayed at one of their houses and watched their boys. It was around 8 p.m. and the boys were sitting on the couch, playing on their iPads and whatnot. 
when somebody had knocked on the door. I asked the boys if anyone was supposed to come over, and they both said no. I then go over and check the peephole in the door, and it's some guy in a gray hoodie, deliberately hunched over so I can't see his face. Immediately, I'm like, hell no, and I don't say anything and just start pacing around because I don't want to give him any inclination that we're inside. A couple of minutes later, I check outside the little window right through the curtains, and he's gone. I don't want to spook the kids anymore, and there weren't any more knocks, so I just kind of let it go as just a prank. Cut to a few hours later, and the moms get back home. They ask me how everything was, and I say that the kids were really great, but somebody had come to the door. They ask me what time, and I said it was around 8, and one of the moms started totally freaking out and then going through her phone. The other one tells me that right around that time, somebody had been making some really strange phone calls to them on a blocked number. They had apparently disguised their voice and then were saying things like, I can see you through your window. They didn't really think it was serious because it didn't really make any sense in the context of where they were, but in retrospect, they were almost positive that it was actually me that he was looking at through the window. They escorted me to my car and I then touched base a little later, and apparently nothing strange ever happened after that. But I'm just really glad that I didn't open that door, because I have a really bad feeling deep in my gut that it would have been really bad. I honestly don't even know how to start this story. I was kind of young at the time, around 7 or 8 years old, but old enough to know exactly what was going on. I lived in a pretty decent neighborhood, but my family was in the process of moving away. There was a large mixture of families with children and retired seniors living on my street. There was a neighborhood babysitter who always took care of my younger sister when she was too young to go to school. She also happened to babysit me as well on multiple occasions. She was always kind of rude to us. She was a pudgy lady with two annoying sons and a very weird husband. A lot of the local kids had gotten taken care of by her, so my parents always trusted her to take care of us. Everything was somewhat normal, except for the fact that she was always kind of rude to anyone that wasn't her own kid. Her kids were pretty misbehaved. They were always fighting, hitting each other with plastic swords, and always screaming at the top of their lungs. At one point, the younger toddlers had to take a nap, and she actually forced all of the children except for her own kids to sit in a corner and be quiet. Pretty odd behavior for a babysitter, but we never really thought too much about it. Another thing to mention is that she always took naps while babysitting. As in, she never paid any attention to the kids. She just shooed them away and fell asleep. She was also really notorious for giving her sons chocolate milk and telling all the others that they could just have water. My sister and I just tried to ignore it, but eventually, we were pretty annoyed of it. My sister had a pretty loud mouth, so she told my mom how she treats the kids she babysits versus her own children. I'd also like to acknowledge that my sister had just turned four at the time, so she really wasn't that great with words. My mom was pretty angry that the babysitter did that, but she just let it slide, as we were going to be moving in about a month and she didn't really know if we were being completely honest about it, as we were little kids, and you know, sometimes kids make this stuff up. The house that we ended up moving to is the same house that I spent a really large majority of my childhood and teenage years in. Things were pretty normal once we transitioned into the new house. That is, until we got the calls. We changed our phone numbers, so we weren't really sure how the babysitter and her husband found it so quickly. She would literally call every single day saying that we needed to pay her and that we owed her money. She was apparently just really angry that we had moved, and we were currently on the lookout for a new babysitter that was closer to home. My parents received these calls literally every day, and they always consisted of the babysitter or her husband always screaming, which meant that I could hear the voicemails and calls very clearly. They just kept harassing us, and my parents grew agitated and really worried. One night it all ended at around 10 p.m. when my sister and I woke up to the loud sound of banging on the front door. It had continued for a good 10 minutes and it was very loud. 
My sister was just totally freaked out, so I decided to go see if my parents were awake. And they were. They were just opening their eyes and kind of confused as to what was going on. My dad had told my mom to stay upstairs as he foolishly went downstairs to get the door as I nervously stood at the railing. My sister had stayed in the bedroom because she was totally unaware as to what was actually happening. When he opened the door, I felt absolutely sick and totally terrified. There was my babysitter and her husband, who managed to not only find our address, but also our phone number. The husband started screaming at the top of his lungs, yelling, You owe us money. Pay us. And shaking a knife while he said it. Yes, he actually had a knife in his hand. My dad told him that we weren't going to pay them and he warned him to leave unless he wanted the cops to be called. Well, he didn't care. My dad went to close the door but he stuck his foot in it, attempting to get inside our house. My babysitter was also yelling but I couldn't really hear what she had said. We had a phone upstairs so my mother quickly and quietly decided to call the cops, all while my dad struggled to get the door closed. Once he did, the banging and screaming just continued. They wouldn't leave our property. I was so freaked out, so I started crying. My sister saw me crying, and she started to do the same. Long story short, about an hour after they left, the cops finally arrived, having just missed them. My parents knew their info based on the fact that they used to babysit us, so it wasn't too hard to track them, and they were indeed arrested. I had always wondered if the night that they did this, if their children was home alone or at a sleepover, especially at a time so late. Regardless, they were released from jail a few days later, but were not allowed to step foot near our house. I'm not sure if the woman still babysits or not, but if she does, I feel really terrible for the kids. We never really knew what their intentions were that night. My dad just saw the knife and just knew that they were up to no good. All I can really say is, to the psychotic babysitter and her crazy husband, I really pray and hope to never see either of you again. The story that I'm about to tell is pretty difficult for me to talk about for two reasons. One is that the main part took place when I was around four or five years old, which makes it really difficult to remember all of the details surrounding the story which is part of the reason that it's haunted me for over 20 years. The other reason is this story makes me feel really uneasy to even really think about, and this might be only the third time I've ever really told it in full. So a little bit of background to this story is that I was born and raised in an extremely close big family. We all lived within about a mile from each other around a really large park in a small Texas town. Now, my family was pretty jam-packed full of aunts and uncles, and I'd say that I saw them all at least once a week during my entire childhood. I really can't stress enough just how close we all were growing up, and also how trusted they all were, as it plays a really important part to this story. So the story came up recently between my mother, older brother, and I, because I had opened up about a series of nightmares that I've basically been plagued with for as long as I can remember. These nightmares are always very similar and basically always consist of me as a small child in my childhood home, always attempting to escape my house while something horrible chases after me. The something is never actually visually seen, but it's more like I sense this massive looming person reaching out to me from the dark, and it always catches me before I can ever get outside. This usually always results in me waking up in a sweat. These dreams always seem to somehow center around these very vague yet oddly detailed memories of a babysitter that I once had. Here's where it gets really odd. The memories I have are almost like dreams. I very specifically remember all of the details of what was happening and the feelings I had, but everything else was just totally out of reach. That goes for the babysitter herself as well. I remember that it was a white female who was middle-aged, but I can't for the life of me recall her face. In my memories, it's like I never really got a good look at her. The very two specific incidences that I can remember were definitely not happy ones. For the first one, I remember that whenever I would get in trouble, I would be forced to sit outside on the back porch in just shorts and a t-shirt, and during winter. 
I remember this because I would always shiver and just sit there quietly, scared that my complaining would cause even more problems. The second memory, well, that was even worse to me. The babysitter seemed to really love this game that she made up. She would turn all of the lights off in the house and would go deeply hide in one of the back rooms. I was left in the front room and I was told that if I wanted food or to watch TV, I had to find her first. I never had any idea where she was hiding and if I ever found her, she would jump out screaming at me like a mad woman and then chase after me. I can distinctly remember her laughing at my fear. I remember pretty often being so frozen with terror that I would sit on the ground near the front door, way too scared to find her. No matter how long I waited, she would never come out of hiding, no matter how hungry I got. I specifically remember this one time pretty well. I was so little and scared. I was whimpering as I slowly built up the bravery to walk to the back hallway to look for her. My hunger felt deadly at this point and I really needed to find her. I checked all of the bathrooms, bedrooms, and closets, but nothing. She was nowhere. I remember standing in my parents' bedroom trying to figure out where she could be. That is, when I saw her. She was this really dark shape under the big bed peeking right at me from under the bed skirt. We just stared at each other, neither one of us moving. I couldn't make out her face, but I just knew that she was smiling at me. She was like this crazy feral animal under there. I remember her sliding herself along the floor so fast. I screamed and turned to run as she then made it to her feet. And then the memory goes completely dark. I don't know what happened after that. And that actually scares me just as much as the memory that I do have of the event. I never share these memories with anyone because they seem so distant, and I often actually wondered if they were even real. One day when I was in my 20s, I decided to mention the nightmares to my mother and brother when we were just sitting around talking during one of the weeks where my brother and I were both home from college. We would often do this to tell funny stories and remember all of the kids we knew from when we were children. Then, I decided to ask my mom about the babysitter. She seemed really confused. She told me that she never hired babysitters for either I or my brother, and because of how big and close my family was and how protective my mom was of us, she never trusted anyone but family to watch us. My aunts and grandmother were the absolute opposite of the woman I remember. Loving, kind, fun, and always treated me like their own children. I could never in a million years imagine them doing those things to me. My mom genuinely seemed confused about this story. She told me that she couldn't even begin to imagine who I was talking about. With her certainty and with the memories being so vague and important places, I had decided that I must have just imagined it all. Then one day, my brother brought it up again while we were driving. Uh, yeah, I remember that. My brother said, with concern in his voice. No, like, I actually remember seeing you get taken outside and being forced to sit there, and I thought it was so terrible. I don't know why we never told anyone. He too had no memory of who the woman was, but he remembers feeling defenseless over the entire thing. He only had vague memories of the horrible game that she would play, but pointed out how he has absolutely no memory of her ever targeting him with her torment. He remembers the events as if he were an audience member. He did, however, remember things that I didn't. This included that I often got in trouble because I would often use my imagination to tell stories, and apparently the babysitter would often get mad about it when she realized it wasn't true, and this would then result in me getting kicked out of the house. I just want to point out that my brother is only one year older than I am, so he too would have been very little when this happened. I've honestly really thought about bringing it back up to my mom, but I honestly trust that she just has no idea who I'm talking about, and I really don't want to make her feel horrible about something so long ago that she clearly has no idea about. I just really wish I could understand what the hell happened and who the hell this person was. My brother never brought it back up again after, but he told me that at the time he just played it off to being so young and just misunderstanding whatever was happening. All I do know is babysitter from my nightmares. Whoever you are and if you're even real, I pray to God that we never meet again, not even in my sleep.
It was a very long time ago. It all happened back in 1973. It was summer, I was six years old, and we were living on Monica Lane in Madison, Wisconsin. The thing is, I sort of recalled it but never really put two and two together until a few months ago when I was talking to my mom who then went into great detail about it. I was a very gregarious child. Outgoing, extroverted, pretty much friends with anyone. It was at the time a middle class neighborhood, and three houses down from Mars on the same side of the street was a huge park. My mom was a nurse and my dad was a salesman, but my mom worked second shift at Meritor while my dad worked days. Now, I rarely ever really had a babysitter, only if they went out for dinner or a movie or something. But they did go out pretty often, and there were always older kids in the neighborhood to babysit. There was this one sitter who I really liked who lived a few blocks or so away, and they were down the street a little bit. Vicky had babysit a few times before that, and it was pretty uneventful. She'd play games with me and do my hair, play dress up, pretty basic stuff. So anyhow, one day I'd gone with friends down to the park. I remember that there was a ball field at the time and a sandlot next to the field. My friends wanted to play on the monkey bars, but I wanted to play in the sand. I looked at the sandbox and my babysitter Vicky was standing there. I told my friends that I was going to go to the sandbox and then ran off. We had played in the sand building a castle and then she had asked me if I wanted to go get something cold to drink. It was really hot and I of course said yes, so she takes my hand and then we start walking to her place. She then started telling me about her puppies and asking if I wanted to play with them. Of course, I start to get really giddy and now I can't wait to get to her house. This is where my memory had stopped and after my mom told me what happened, the rest of it totally flooded back. My mother just happened to be talking to my sister and I about some of the places we lived and we got to Monica Lane. I told her that I remembered the park and how big it seemed and then she asked me if I remember being kidnapped there. I immediately thought that she was kidding and then the look on her face told me otherwise. She said that it was around 5 in the afternoon and one of my friends had come to the door to ask me to come back outside, sure that I had gotten bored and then walked back home. When my mom checked the house though and realized I wasn't there, she sprints to the park screaming my name. After going around asking several of the kids if they'd seen me with no clue, she went to the ball field and she asked some of the older boys if they'd seen me. One of the boys, I guess around 14, said that he'd seen a younger woman playing with a girl that fit my description in the sand, and that she then walked off in the general direction and that was really all he knew. My mom ran across the street to one of the houses and asked to use their phone, and then called the police. By the time the police got there, my dad had come home and some of the neighbors were trying to help my mom find me. So there's this search party out looking for me, now screaming my name and knocking on doors. The police had gone back to the park to ask the boys if they knew who had been with me and if they knew who she was. Between the boys and the neighbors, they had figured out who it was that had led me off, but I honestly have no idea how they figured it out. The police and the entourage then go to her home and then knock on the door. She came to the door and she told them she hadn't seen me and that she'd been home all day. The police asked if they could come in and for some weird reason she said okay. They went through the house and then they went to the basement and that's when they found me. That's what my mom knew and then I remembered. It was literally like a floodgate had opened and I then started crying. At six years old you sort of just trust everyone and she'd been in our home. I had never got a bad feeling from her before and neither did my parents. But when we walked into her house I remember that cold holy crap feeling washing over me and getting very worried. I remember starting to cry and saying that I wanted to go home over and over. She takes me into her kitchen and then gets me a glass of water and a tissue. I can hear the sound of dogs barking and next to the kitchen is an open stairway. It then goes down to where the barking was coming from. She starts trying to convince me into going downstairs, then telling me that there's all sorts of toys and games down there. I reluctantly agree and she then grabs my hand to head down the stairs. The dogs are going nuttier and then I start screaming. At this point, Vicky's getting freaking bizarre. She's now screaming at me. Shut the hell up! If you don't shut up, I'll throw you in the cage with the dogs and they're gonna eat you. 
Then she starts dragging me down the stairs, all the while I'm still screaming. I was scared out of my mind at this point. I remember crying so hard I was hyperventilating, and I'm screaming so bad that I'm not even making a sound. Vicky then flips a switch and starts being syrupy sweet to me, trying to calm me down. She tells me that she was just playing a game with me, and she tells me she wants to play hide and seek with me. Vicky must have been relatively skilled at calming me down because the next thing I know, I hear knocking on the door from upstairs and I wasn't crying anymore. The houses were all the same sort of track houses that Sears used to sell. Not huge but not small, but you could hear just about everything at any spot in the house. I keep hearing the knocking and she tells me that it's just her friends. That they're coming to play hide and seek with us. Vicky somehow convinced me to let her put a piece of masking tape right over my mouth so that I wouldn't make a sound, and then she lifted me into this big wooden box next to the kennel. She put a really big pile of blankets over me and told me to be really quiet so they didn't find me. The whole time of this the dogs were going batshit crazy, but for some reason when she calmed me down, they calmed down too. They still looked incredibly mean, but they were no longer frothing at the mouth and they were only slightly growling now, until the knocking started. I remember scrunching in there, totally confused as to what's going on. Still scared and convinced that the dogs were going to get out and then eat me. I was crying again, and also hyperventilating. I remember removing the tape from my mouth because I couldn't breathe, but I remember I needed to be quiet because I was so afraid of what she'd do to me if I screamed. I laid in that nasty smelly box next to a big bag of dog food sweating to hell with lots of tears rolling down my face. I sort of pushed the blankets to the side, but only enough so that I could pull them back over me if someone came. I recalled thinking about my dad and just really wondering if he'd ever come find me. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, I can hear what sounds like adults yelling my name. They come down the stairs and the dogs are going absolutely batshit yet again. Over and over, men are yelling my name, and then I hear a man then say, If you don't shut those freaking dogs up, I will. I was in a really large storage box with tape hanging off my mouth when they opened the lid. I can distinctly remember a very nice man asking me my name and if I was doing okay. I don't really remember answering him in anything other than screams and tears, and then grabbing his neck so hard that my dad had to practically pry me off of him. I remember my parents taking me to the hospital to be checked out, and that's all I really remember. My mom said that Vicky was then found guilty of attempted kidnapping, and the last she knew that she was apparently in prison, but couldn't really remember the last time she heard anything. We moved from that area shortly after, and I haven't been back since. I do know that my mom said that her parents were really odd, but they didn't really know them. She had met Vicky from the neighbors that used her as a babysitter, and they had never really heard anything bad of her, and that I always seemed happy with her. She lived in the general neighborhood, but it would have been two blocks over and one block down. Mom said they never picked her up, she always walked over. Whenever they'd get home, they'd drive her home, but never really noticed anything out of the ordinary. Mom and Dad only met her parents when they came to the door to ask for forgiveness. That Vicky hadn't really meant to do anything bad, and that she was a good girl. My mom said that my dad picked up her dad by the shirt and told them if they ever come on our property ever again, he'd kill them. I remember her name and sort of what she looked like, but I don't think I'd have any idea who she was if she walked up to me. Hopefully I'll never see her again though. This happened a couple of months ago, and I'm finally feeling safe being alone again. It was around 1.30pm when my dog started barking for me to take him outside. I had put him on his leash and walked outside my first floor apartment, leaving the door unlocked behind me like I had done a million times before. Seriously, I never ever thought twice about it as I live in a really safe neighborhood in an extremely safe, almost boring town. In my 27 years of living here, nothing had ever tested that sense of security before. My dog is 15 years old, so he moves a little slow and really loves taking his time sniffing around. He'll usually just stop and pee about three different times and then take that day as no different. But suddenly, a big white truck filled with lawn equipment slowed down right in front of me. Hey, make sure you pick up after your dog. 
I then looked up and saw a man in his late 40s or so, wearing polarized sunglasses and a bandana around his lower mouth and neck. Um, he just peed. I responded with a little bit of attitude, like, thanks, but I got this. Now drive away. I looked up yet again and he then gave me a wink and then lowered his bandana to blow me a kiss right before he drives away. This man had instantly made me really uncomfortable. But as a young Hispanic female, I had been pretty used to older Hispanic men being inappropriate like that. They've been doing it for years. It's just a really sad reality. But once again, I didn't really think too much into it. I was walking back to my apartment now when a woman came out of her apartment in the next building over and then stood on her patio motioning for me to come to her. Now, I've never met this lady in my life before. I had seen her around the complex and she seemed pretty nice enough, but ultimately I didn't really know her. I've watched Dateline before, so I'm definitely not going up to her patio. I asked her what she wanted and she just insisted that I go over there so that she could tell me. I told her that I really needed to bring my dog back inside my apartment, but that maybe I could help her from outside where I was if she just told me. Next thing I know, this woman is now freaking running right toward me. That's when I picked up my dog ready to run home, and that's when she stopped probably about five feet away from me, and then she said, Look, please listen to me. A man walked to your apartment while you were walking your dog. I think he was one of the mowers. I was sitting in my car when I saw him walk in, and I know you live there alone. I called 911, and they're on their way now. I could feel my face burning as I was trying to process what I just heard. I'd watched the man that I had talked to drive away. I didn't see his truck anywhere. How could that be possible? What I didn't realize was that while I was talking to him, he had positioned his truck right in the line of sight of my apartment. I couldn't see my door, so I was totally distracted and looking away while another man had walked right inside my apartment. If my neighbor didn't happen to be sitting in her car while on the phone, I would have walked right into my apartment completely unaware that someone would be inside of it waiting to do God knows what to me. I'm honestly so thankful that she was so observant even prior to the incident because she knew that there shouldn't be anyone else in that apartment and she had a really bad gut feeling that something was wrong. The police arrived not even five minutes later and arrested the guy. This guy actually told the police that he had permission to use my restroom, which was freaking obviously not true. Since my door was unlocked and we can't really prove what his intentions were when he entered, he was only charged with trespassing. That's actually a misdemeanor in my state and he did no jail time, which obviously really freaked me out because this guy knew where I lived. The man driving the truck technically didn't really do anything wrong, but it's really scary to think that they might have been working together. I ended up staying with my parents until we were able to find a legal loophole to get me out of my lease and move out of that apartment ASAP. I moved into a house with an old friend of mine and got a ring system installed that same day. My dog has his own backyard now, my dad mows the lawn for us, and I still sometimes get coffee with the neighbor who called the cops for me. Even to this day, I'm so thankful for her gut feeling. Honestly, if it wasn't for her, God knows what could have happened. I live in a city that has quite a bit of wealth inequality, and it's also a spot where homeless people like to congregate from all over. I live in a pretty decent area in an apartment, and it has a security gate to get into the building. My spouse was feeling pretty sick and convinced me to take the dog out for his final walk of the night, even though I protested that I didn't feel safe doing it. I'm quite short and pretty small. My dog is about 70 pounds but is pretty goofy looking and pretty friendly on the street. And for some weird reason, he's really only protective when we're in the apartment. I wasn't able to find my pepper spray, but the dog was whining so I went to walk him anyway. I stuck to where the streetlights were on our busy street and he did his business like usual. I turned around and I noticed a dirty looking man that was riding a bicycle. He was coming right towards me from out of the dark from behind a building, and then he started yelling things like, Hey, I'm not gonna hurt you. See, even your doggy likes me. I won't hurt you, I promise. And then he sped up towards me. 
I started running with my dog right to the security gate and then keyed in the code as the man got to the embankment and started closing in on me. It was maybe about 10 yards away at that point. I slammed the gate behind me and ran up to my apartment. I never ever leave without my pepper spray and I don't walk outside the apartment at night anymore. And I mean ever. So I'm a 22 year old female and I just moved into this apartment complex in the heart of downtown Baltimore. Tonight was my second night living here and I went to do the laundry that was on the lower level of the complex and I decided to use the gym that was also on the lower level while I waited for my clothes to get washed. So I'm in the gym working out and it's a small room with not really much equipment. I was the only one in there and I see this guy in the hallway that's right outside just kind of staring at me. I kind of just ignored him and just continued working out until he came into the gym and then gave me a thumbs up and then he said, Good job. I kind of just smiled at him and said thank you. He then comes into the gym and starts getting on the treadmill. I didn't want to be confined in a small space with this guy, so I went into the laundry room and my washer was almost finished. So for the next couple of minutes I decided to just wait and text on my phone. Well, a few minutes later, the same guy comes inside and he went to do his load of clothes. And then he came up to me and he put his phone right in my face and it was on Google Translate and it then read, You're beautiful. I had told the man thank you and he just continued to translate for me to read it. He's from Saudi Arabia and he barely spoke any English. He then went on to ask me through the phone if I wanted to be his friend. I kind of have a hard time saying no, so I just kind of shrugged and said okay. Then he asked again through Google Translate for my number. I gave him a fake and he called it right in front of me. And of course, my phone didn't ring. He continued to call and still nothing. He told me to wait there in the laundry room while he ran back to the elevators. I started to get a really bad feeling so I left the laundry room. I waited on the other side of the hallway past the elevators and then turned the corner where he wouldn't see me and then texted my boyfriend what was happening. The elevator door then opened up and the man comes out and I heard him go into the laundry. I had this really bad gut feeling telling me to run and I'm never really a frantic person or anything so I don't really get spooked that easily but I don't know how to explain it. I just had a really bad feeling. I started to press on the exit button to unlock the door that leads you to outside, but it wasn't budging. From the mirror on the wall, I saw him turn around and saw him head into the gym and I knew that he was going to check this side next, so I kept frantically pushing on the button and the doors finally unlocked and then I ran outside. I probably walked around for about 10 minutes on the phone with my boyfriend, just telling him everything that happened. I went to the lobby of my complex and I asked the front lady if she could escort me to the laundry room. She said yes and then we went. Thankfully the man wasn't there and I was able to put my clothes in the dryer. The lady from the front desk told me to come back and get her when the dryer was done. So about 45 minutes go by and the front desk lady and I went to the laundry room. And guess who's there? The man. He started to do this really creepy smile and was about to say something until he saw who I was with and then became really quiet. I got my clothes and we left and the guy left too. We all got in the elevator with the lady in between us and her and I got off on the lobby floor. The reason we got off on the lobby floor was so that she could show me where the other laundry rooms were on the other side of the complex. I then thanked her and went on my way. I waited for the elevator to come down and when it did and the doors opened, that man came off of it and held the door open for me. I said no and told him that I would wait for the next one. I really didn't want him to know which floor that I lived on. The man got off the elevator and he was pacing back and forth and huffing and puffing. As soon as the next elevator opened, I got on it and then he tried to get on it with me. I immediately got off and then he said to me, Come on in come inside. I said no and he started to get really mad at me and then started to walk right towards me. I booked it back to the lobby and to my luck, the lady from the front desk was already heading my way, telling me she had already saw what happened on the security camera. She escorted me to my room and made sure I got home okay. I'm really so thankful that she was there. 
This probably wouldn't have happened to me if I would have just cut the conversation short with the man. I've never been this freaked out before, and I've never felt this unsafe either. Even though he didn't necessarily do anything wrong to me, it was really just the vibe I got from him. I'm going to get a gym membership that's only a few minutes to walk from my building, and I'm definitely going to use the laundry room that's on the other side of the complex, just so I can lessen the chance of ever having to run into that man ever again. I just really want to avoid him at all costs. This happened in November 2018. I was a 19-year-old woman living alone in a two-bedroom apartment. I live in a college town that has a significant population but a pretty low crime rate. This kind of thing just doesn't really happen around here. Or so I thought. I came home one night after hanging out with my girlfriend a little intoxicated and I set my keys down on my kitchen counter. I lose my keys pretty often, so I kinda just told myself at least 10 different times the keys were on the counter before just stumbling off to bed. I woke up at around 8am the next morning and cleaned my kitchen and living room a little bit before getting ready for an appointment that I had. While I was getting ready to head out the door, I realized that my keys were missing from the counter. I searched my apartment up and down but I just couldn't find them so I decided to take an Uber as to not miss my appointment. During my way home, I decided to call my mom and tell her about my missing keys. She suggested that I search my trash because maybe I accidentally threw them away while I was cleaning. As soon as I walked back into my apartment, my stomach sank. My apartment smelled absolutely disgusting. It was a scent that I don't think I can accurately describe or even put into words. It was absolutely revolting, and something just felt really off. I thought that it might have just been because I had some dishes that were in the sink that I just hadn't washed for a couple of days. So I decided to take some time to wash my dishes and then decided to search the trash for my keys. I put on some rubber gloves and laid out trash bags on my living room floor, then dumped all of my trash on top of them and started searching for them. What I found was completely revolting. There was a bag of bird feathers, a pair of soaking wet socks, a clump of gray hair, and a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, which I hate with a passion, so I just knew it wasn't mine. At this point, I was panicking. I decided to snap a picture and text it to my girlfriend before calling her. Hello? She answered. Amy, I think there's someone hiding in my apartment. I came home and found stuff in my trash that I just know isn't mine. It smells weird and I just have a really bad feeling. I was on the verge of tears and my anxiety was totally through the roof. <sighs> Babe, this is just your anxiety talking. I really doubt that there's anyone in your apartment. You live across the street from the stadium and there was a football game last night. Maybe someone was drunk and came into your apartment to just throw some stuff away. Or maybe someone used your trash when you had the friends giving party. Why don't you ask some of your friends who were there? She said. I knew her explanations didn't really make sense, all things considered, but I wanted to believe them anyways. I kind of just smiled and laughed a little before responding. Yeah, you're probably right. I'm just being unreasonable. Per usual, right? I said. You should really try and get your mind off of things if your anxiety is this bad. Why don't you come to dinner with me and my parents tonight? Take a shower. I'll pick you up. We're going somewhere a little bit fancier, so wear something nice. She said. Sure, I'd love to. I love you. I said as I hung up the phone. I walked to my bathroom, grabbing a towel and taking off my jeans and underwear before throwing it all in the dryer so that it would be warm when I got out of the shower. Since my apartment had two bedrooms and I was the only person living there at the time, I used the spare bedroom to store all my laundry and fancier clothes. It was nearing finals week so I hadn't really done my laundry for a good minute and there was a really giant pile of dirty clothes on the floor of that room. All of my fancier sweaters and dresses were hanging in the closet. Still completely butt-ass naked, I headed to the spare bedroom to grab a sweater for dinner with Amy's family. As soon as I opened the door, the bad smell became a hundred times worse to the point that I thought I was going to pass out. I carefully stepped inside and then completely froze, noticing a large tattooed hand sticking out of the pile of the laundry. Now, as a completely naked 19-year-old girl who then walked in on a stranger in her own apartment, the reasonable thing to do would have been to calmly leave the room, get dressed, go outside, and then call 911. 
However, my immediate reaction was to just scream at the top of my lungs. What the hell? Who are you? What are you doing in my apartment? I totally shrieked, tears totally streaming right down my face. My entire body was totally consumed with terror. I felt like I couldn't even move. A large, clearly drugged up woman jumped out of the pile of clothes and then faced me, then started screaming. I have a gun and I will kill you. Don't you dare call the police. I forced myself to move, sprinting to the bathroom and grabbing my phone on the counter as I did so. I slammed the door right behind me and then locked it, falling to my knees while on the floor. The police really terrify me, and so was this woman threatening me if I called them. So, against my better judgment, I dialed my dad's number instead with really shaky hands. Meanwhile, this woman was banging on the door, shrieking and threatening me. Hello? Let me inside. You whore. Don't you dare call the police. I'll freaking kill you. She continued to scream while pounding on the door. Dad, there's someone in my apartment. I'm not kidding, do you hear her? She's trying to freaking kill me. Please help me. You stupid whore, I've been here for three freaking days now. I'll freaking kill you. Angela, what are you doing calling me? Call 911 right now. My dad said. I hung up the phone and took his advice, dialing 911 as fast as possible. As soon as the woman heard me speaking to the operator, she ran outside, slamming the front door right behind her. As I tried explaining what was going on, I got dressed and tried to run outside to see which way she went. When she ran, she also took her trash with her. When the police got there, they asked me for a description of the woman, and we searched my apartment to see if she had taken anything besides the trash. Unsurprisingly, she took all of my prescription drugs for anxiety and ADHD. Yeah, that was pretty fun to explain to my doctor. Besides that, the cops were essentially pretty useless. There was never any kind of follow-up, and as far as I know, they never found her. I moved into my parents' house for a couple of weeks until I could find a new apartment, and I couldn't even enter the building until about a week later. I threw away pretty much everything hygiene-related in case she had used it, and then I sanitized just about everything, especially my clothes. While searching that spare bedroom, I found some notebooks that were filled with really crazy writings and black witchcraft, dirty underwear, three pairs of car keys that belonged to God knows who, and a ton of food trash. I turned it into the police. So I ended up moving into a third story apartment, installing automatic keypad locks and security cameras, getting a cat so I felt less alone, and going to therapy, mainly because that situation caused me so much anxiety. For six months, I couldn't enter my apartment if I'd gone more than five minutes unless I was on the phone with someone. I also still occasionally get nightmares or sometimes swear that I can smell it again. I just really hope to God that I never encounter that woman ever again. She was just so insane. A few years back when I was 19 years old, I had just gotten my very first apartment that was in the basement of an apartment complex. That might sound odd, but a friend's mother talked to the apartment's landlord to find me a cheap place to live. This was in Denver, so it really wasn't that cheap for a one-bedroom apartment in most places. This will all be relevant later. The basement apartment was a studio that was located at the base of a flight of stairs. It was the only apartment at the bottom of these stairs between the apartment's boiler room and the laundry room. And even farther down, there was a brick hallway with a screen door and a landing before you finally even get to my apartment. The first couple of months of living alone were honestly pretty fine. There was a smoking area up the flight of stairs that led to my apartment. One day I was up there just doing my thing and having a cigarette, when a Native American man sat next to me and then also started smoking. He was a resident in the apartment. His name was John. John seemed mostly normal, maybe a little bit lonely, but nothing really unnerving. He said that he lived alone and that he was an artist. We started to chat until my cigarette was through. I said goodbye to John and then went back downstairs. I would see John pretty occasionally smoking as I was going to or coming from work. He would always just say hi to me and never really gave off any kind of red flags, which makes this all the more creepy. One night when I was sleeping, I woke up to the sound of the doorknob to my apartment jiggling. It was like someone was frantically trying to break the lock. 
I got out of bed and then immediately grabbed a knife from the kitchenette. If this had been a normal room in the apartment complex, someone would have heard the doorknob rattling, but my apartment was secluded on the subterranean level. I stood right next to the jiggling doorknob and then said, Um, hello? Who's there? No one answered. I looked through the peephole, but it was way too dark to see. I then said in a loud, confident voice, I'm just going to tell you now, if you come in here, I'm going to kill you. And I was pretty serious about it too. Back then, I was pretty fearless and in a not so great mental state. I just wanted to explain that because I know some people are going to question my reaction to this. However, the jiggling immediately stopped. Whoever it was booked it back through the screen door, right down the hallway, and up the dark flight of stairs. I don't really know if they thought I was asleep until then or what, but I think I scared them off. I could see their dark outline go up the stairs through the peephole, but couldn't really make out the person's features. I made a really big mistake that night when I decided not to call the cops. I just felt like it would be a hassle and that it was probably just some drunk idiot causing mischief. My heart was really pounding from the adrenaline, but I felt really confident that I could take care of myself. So I mostly just put the incident right out of my mind. Well, about a week later, late at night around 2 a.m., I then woke up and I realized the door to my apartment was wide open. I was really in shock and I couldn't really process what I was looking at. I walked toward the door, wondering how someone could have come and left like that, making no sound. I remember that my heart was beating furiously and that it was really difficult to breathe. Every footstep I took felt like I was walking further and further into a fatal danger zone. I examined the door and the doorknob had been completely removed from its socket. I really don't know how he managed to break the doorknob out of there without waking me up. I've entertained many possibilities. Maybe he used a knife and carved it out. Maybe it wasn't fastened securely in the first place and he just popped it out on accident. But I mean, it held pretty sturdily when he was jiggling it the week before, so I didn't really get it. I'm a fairly light sleeper, so I just really don't understand how he could have done it. Even to this day, it still really bothers me. There was a really clean hole where the doorknob was mounted to the door, and the doorknob was gone. I never did find it. So, do you remember that kitchen knife that I had threatened the intruder with the week before? Well, it was lying on the ground right next to my bed. Maybe I got up and put it next to me in my sleep. I don't know. It's all still a mystery to me and that's why this occurrence still bothers me so much. I just can't figure it out. This person had been in my room possibly watching me sleep and they had just left without doing anything. I guess I'm lucky, but I'll never really know why. I bought a deadbolt for the door and had the doorknob replaced. And since people will probably ask, no, I never called the cops. Like I said, I was in a really bad mental state and didn't really have a lot of energy to care about myself. But that's besides the point. I was really on edge for the next few weeks, but nothing happened until a few weeks later, when the guy tried to break in in broad daylight. He was doing his doorknob jiggling routine yet again and I saw that this time that it was John and he was completely drunk. I know this because I yelled at him and he drunkenly scurried back up the stairs like the first time. John was apparently known for having a drinking problem. After that time though, the entire complex knew what he had done and the owner of the building actually urged me to press charges against him and I'm pretty sure that they eventually evicted him. However, I never pressed charges. As I said before, I just really didn't care enough to get the police involved. I moved out shortly after. Like I said, the unanswered questions still really haunt me. What did he want? Why did he do this? And why did he pick my place specifically to break into? I guess I'll never really know. Still, John, I could really care less to ever see you again.